Mis hijos, mis hijos, mamá les ama, mamá les encontrará y traerá a casa nuevamente para que podamos estar juntos para siempre. Hey everybody, can you hear me? Hope everybody can hear me. Oh, chat's filling up now. I did nothing today but talk on the phone to several different people. And all of it pertained to the show in some form or another. 
only had to text a little bit for my job. And that was a change of pace, uh, you know, from what I'm usually, you know, but Sundays usually I don't have a whole lot to go on. And so I, I had just finished having a really important phone call. I had two in particular with different people today. And I think that uh, I'm going to tentatively, nervously say this. I think that this war is almost over. I think that we're ready to, to both sides are ready to, to end it. This could be it. I mean, please pray that we can move on. There'll always be people that'll come and mess around and do whatever they're going to do. But I think that for the most part, I think that I want to say the worst of it's over. Most of the major players are bowing out. There's one guy who was just kind of didn't really do a whole lot during the war, which I considered him one of the filthy five. And he kind of flew under the radar for most of you. But I think he's made a few moves as of late. I think he's making his last little whatever. His damage was actually done going up to this war. And if you remember the people that were involved in starting it, one of them likes to, you know, use her magic powers. That was the beginning and she teamed up with, you know, somebody. And the rest is history. That was the prelude to it. That was the Clone Wars going, if you're a Star Wars fan there. As Gandalf said, if you're a uh, Lord of the Rings fan, that was the deep breath before the plunge. And um, let's make no mistake, this is not a joke. It was not a game. It was not an imaginary thing. A lot of people were affected by this. We were affected severely by it. We did a cleanse of our house again today after I got off the last phone call. Um, or I should say the first phone call when did a cleanse, there was something very strong in my house that they put there. It was, it's, you know, rough. So we got it done. I had a talk with this, with one person and stuff was taken down and on both our ends. And I think that's it. I think it's going to be the end of that. And um, which we never should have been in the first place. And the people, he and I both agreed that there's a lot of people who are instigating, but one or two in particular. There's really only one person who's not come to the table, or two people who have not come to the table and said, "Hey, let's 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 do let's quit," you know, whatever. And that is the big bad voodoo daddy. And um, you know, I want peace. I don't know what you want, man, but I want peace. I know that you're never going to try to reach out and, and end it. But uh, if he leaves me alone, I leave him alone. That's all I care about right now. I just want to end it. I want it over. And uh, some people think that there's winners and losers. Depends on how you look at it. Uh, you can say we won if you look at it a certain way. And if you look at it another way, well, nobody won. But from the, the looks of the numbers and everything else, we didn't lose. I just wish that everything would go back to normal, at least to where we could just have peace. The problem with this show and whatever is that the, the way that we grow and that we are in all these different genres, you're going to ruffle feathers. It's going to happen. And people are going to just attack you. And you're going to wonder why. And sometimes it seems like it's just there's no reason. But growth does that. They feel like you're stepping on their toes. And that's going to happen. What I and Anthony and my wife and everyone else here at PRT talked about was we're going to have to decide how much we're going to be able to ignore because we don't address all of it. Contrary to popular belief, they think that every time someone gets upset with us, we run out and address it. We don't, believe me. If we showed you the amount of hate mail, if we showed you the amount of hate that we get, whether it's from people who've managed to get our phone numbers and call us and text us and say all kinds of crap. Don't know how they do, they do what they do, but they do. Or it's through various emails. They even got two of my private emails, which I never gave out. Or whether it's through Messenger or Instagram or Twitter or whatever. They do what they do. They continue to do what they do. And guess what? They even mail us 
letters. They write letters. Who sits down nowadays, this day and age, and writes a letter and tells you they hate your guts? But they do. I've gotten two of them. Only two handwritten ones. Neither one of them I, I finished. I just threw them away. You wasted your time in the ink and the paper and the stamps. It's a special kind of hate. Um, so that's that's what we've gone through. And now, I think maybe after tonight, I'm hoping that this won't have to be brought up again. I'm hopeful. I don't know, Anthony. What do you think? I'm hopeful. Yeah. I'm looking at a better brief. Cautiously optimistic. Cost, cautiously optimistic. And at the very least, we just won't put it on the channel. We're doing everything we can, but it's it's a daily struggle, you know. Hopefully, the talking and everything that we've been doing, and like adults, has, has it will work at least for most of them, most of the people. This whole thing's got me turned around. Like I don't know where I'm coming or going. I don't know who's coming out of the the, the wood pile to strike, and it's just that uh, it's really rough. I'll be making a Facebook video tomorrow addressing uh, some things, and, and then hopefully that's it. We can move past it. We can go. That's it. So that's it. We're gonna, It's all the time we're going to vote to that. We're done. Um, you know, everybody's saying, hey, we don't want to talk about it. We don't want to hear about it. You know, some people are. Some people aren't. Um, but, yeah, it, it's, it has to be done. I mean, we have to. We have to never see anything like it. I have a lot of um, of friends in this field that still back me up, that still are, are my friend. They didn't run away and think, oh, I'm not going to work with this guy because he's under attack. Nobody did that. Only one person canceled on me, and I'm pretty sure he was in the other camp. Um, but other than that, no, there hasn't been anybody. That's it. Nobody's abandoned ship and turned their back on me other than, you know, one of the filthy five who was never really my friend, was he? And so, yeah, didn't really hurt too much. But we want to do things here at PRT that pertain to uh, talking about dogmen, ghosts, Bigfoot, things like that, alien abduction. Weird, strange stuff. Shadow people, crawlers. That's why you're here. And once we get the chat filled up a little bit, we'll we'll start talking because I got some things to talk about. I got a lot of stories to go over. I don't know how many I'll get to do tonight, but I'll cover some people's encounters. Thank you, Love Cat, for that donation. As I said before, we are trying to get money together to buy camera equipment, which is something that we have for the show, but not for going out into the field, which is what we need to do. I, I really and I really enjoy going out. Yeah, I enjoy it. I think it's something I'm going to start doing pretty regularly. Yeah, people like it. Uh, people like it. You, you guys, after all the talking that I did and negotiating and trying to get things done and apologizing, which I had to do some of that today too because I was wrong, and particularly about one person. So, what I did, I, I, I sat there in my in my study and I was just like, just, "There's nothing to do," you know. Yeah. And so I thought. Why don't I just look at cameras? Which, there again, I don't even know what the hell I'm looking at. So yeah. what am I doing? <laughs> well, I'm eyeballing a night vision one. Well, that's your that's your department, which you do. Mm -hmm. And so I'm sitting there, and I just go, well, you know, let's just uh, mm -hmm. let's just put my glasses on here. Let me see what I can do. <laughs> I don't know anything about this. It's like looking at dogs that you don't know what breeds they are. What is yeah. that? What, what kind of dog, you know? Um, and, and I'm smart enough to, to, to admit that I don't know. This is not my thing, you know. So I was thinking about reaching out to Doug Hijack and saying, hey, Doug, what do you know about this? Doug is, of course, the guy from, from Monster Quest. And he had after, he'd once told me if I needed advice about that, you know, whatever. Or maybe Chris Garitano or Eric Palacios. I tried calling Eric yesterday. Um, and then he called back, so my phone was going straight to voicemail, which a bunch of people were telling me that. I don't know if that's something that, you know. Um, so I was th looking at these cameras and I, I just, just to see what they looked like and how much they were or whatever. And have you ever, have you ever been there looking at a price on something and you're not really paying enough attention and you just kind of look, you kinda, you're looking at the, the product and you're d examining it like, oh, this looks like something I would buy. And then you look down at the price, oh, that's cool, you know? And then, you, and then you're sitting there for like 10 solid minutes debating about buying it and thinking, well, it's, that's a decent price, $119. 
and then you you go to like look down again, just you know to you know whatever, and it's like, oh, didn't have my glasses on. You look at the glasses, you're like, oh, whoa, 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 there's an extra number there. <laughs> this is 119. There's an extra zero. Yes, this is 1119. Okay, well that that solves the riddle of whether or not I'm going to even pretend to buy this thing. <laughs> You know, you're over there like, you know, so I'm just going to put this in my cart. <laughs> it's 119 if it doesn't work out, you know. It's funny because the, the, the... It doesn't. <laughs> it's not going to work. Because the night vision one I'm eyeballing is like $1,000, but it's like top of the line. Oh, really? Crazy looking. Yeah. You put something in my throat when you said $1,000. <laughs> I mean, it's $1, for... $1,000? It's for the people. For the people? Yeah. They don't even want it. They just... They do want it. They want us to get a $1,000 night vision camera. Okay, well, that's not what I'm seeing here. I'm seeing $10 donations. Thank you, Maddie. Uh, no, we're good. Thank you. What? Okay, this is for a conversation. Why a thousand? Why does it have to be $1,000? Well, I mean, like, that's just the first one that, that I found. But it, it, Well, like, let's find the second one. It looks really one. cool. Okay. It looks cool. What does that mean, it looks cool? Does it make us I've look cool? I looked it up. It makes okay. us look cool. It, it, okay, it's a night vision camera, but it, it, it's not like it's not like the green night vision, and, it, and it's not the black and white night vision. It's like color night vision. I, I think the people it's are okay with black looking. and white. What is with the black and white's cheaper, right? Yeah, but it looks like crap. But, the, but you know, but that's that makes it look more authentic. Look at I Love no. Lucy. Okay, y'all look at all those shows, Gunsmoke, when it was in black and white. Y'all want to see color black more... and white. I mean, I mean, color night vision, right? Not, not that black and white. I like crap. World War II and black and white better. Not too. that green crap. Right you want like color infrared? I mean, uh, color night vision. That looks cool. Well, well, once I show you, you you'll change your mind. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Once I hit, we, when we win the lottery, folks, we will have the best equipment in the entire field. Trust me on that one. I give you my word. On that one. And then talking about the big lottery with it's like 300 million, and then they actually only give you 10, but at least you have the 10 and the government gets the rest. Yeah, I'll get that one. That's when that will happen right there. I don't know. I don't, I don't have money for that. Uh, PRT, the best. Thank you, Jazz. Gevezant, uh, G. Van Zant. Okay, 661. $20. Thank you for that donation. And, and of course, Curtis, thank you for that donation. We are the target rather than dollar store of the field. Mm -hmm. uh, Lolita D Davidovich. Yeah, we're, we're the target, you know, or Walmart because we're a one stop shop. But let's think of it as Walmart in its early days when it was actually cool, when they when they sold like popcorn and stuff. And yeah, when they had the radio grill. Yeah, they had the radio grill and it smelled like it in the store and it was cool and fun to go check it out. And, and, the, and the, the aisles were a little more squished mm -hmm. together, you know. And they had all these products and it was a one stop shop and it was a cool place. I used to love to go to Walmart back then. Now I can't, I don't go to Walmart now. I just won't do it. Jordan Cogburn, thank you for that donation. Did we thank Indy Southpaw? Indy Southpaw. Oh, for, thank you for that donation. Some toward the night vision camera. So now we just need nine more of Indy Southpaw, and we can get that wonderful night vision camera. <laughs> that would be uh, super awesome. Thank you. Man, I've been doing too good the last few shows. I mean, we must suck. Because if we can live stream with that, with that camera, that'd be like something that nobody else is doing. Because people have like the, the they'll go out uh, to the woods and stuff with like good cameras, but it's not it's not it's uh it's all pre-recorded. It's not live stream, so it's like you're not really, you know, like it, the audience is not there with you in real time. If we can get that camera and and manage to live stream, like that that that, that would be something that a lot of people will like. Because because like they don't get it anywhere else. Because it's a live stream with a with a night vision. Yeah, like with, help, with help good night vision. Do none of that. Um, you probably ought to ask Jesse and Joe. I think probably... there's, uh, I think their stuff is pre-recorded, which I mean, like, but but th there's a lot of production value that goes in into the into their stuff that's pre-recorded because there's a lot of editing and and uh, like really cool like it, it's almost their stuff is like done like a documentary, mm. which which is uh, like a, a really smart like popular thing to do and it it takes a long time to to do it but uh, like the the. Live streaming with that kind of equipment is is like something that I don't think a whole lot of people are doing. Uh, but if and if if we're out there and we don't get signal, then we we, we might have to get like uh, some kind of uh, like 
I don't know, satellite internet thing that has like tethering. I, I don't know. I, I'll have to figure it out. Taylor says, finally able to donate, and I'm planning to make it for the conference. Um, yeah, Seven System says, Hellbent goes live. But do they, do they go live while they're, like, way out there deep in the woods? Because I think a lot of their, of their uh, stuff, when, when they spin... A lot of their time when they spend in the was I think like that's their pre-recorded footage and they they spend a lot of time editing that um, and you know getting it like real professional and color graded and everything. Hmm. Well, we'll see what happens. Uh. Yeah, Catherine says sometimes HH does go live. Mm -hmm. Jeffrey Schneider says, ask Hell Ben Holler. Really? I hadn't thought of that, Jeffrey. <laughs> Thank you for that. Let's ask the, let's ask Jesse and Joe. I just texted them right now. So <laughs> let's ask Jesse and Joe. Hey, Larry, how you doing? Keep your chin up, Larry. Everything will be fine, dude. You're a good guy. Brandon has, uh, he says, have y'all ever reached out to Cam at Crypt D Dixie Cryptid? I think y'all would vibe really well. Man, there are so many people that, that we are trying to get to to work with and people that want to work with us i mean there's no shortage of that that's that's a good thing there's no, no shortage of people who want to work with us we're not like like the people that you know we were having problems with they're trying to make it out like we were some kind of pariahs in the community or whatever that's not the case we just don't have the time gil says actually a thousand dollars is on the lower end for night vision See, so it doesn't even matter anyway. The one you're looking at is like a lower end piece of crap. Yeah, but it still looks really good. It was just on Amazon. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I I looked it up on their website, and then and then I looked up like the some YouTube comparisons between like when they're filming with the night vision off and with it on. Did you? Because I'm saying like if, if if you need to look at like the 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 reviews. Yeah. And see. Because that that that's you know that could be I don't know I mean that that could make you know there just could be something that you know it looks really cool and then it's just a piece of crap and we waste a thousand dollars and it breaks or some crap or it doesn't do yeah James Aletto says low end is better than a flashlight the problem is that all I have is a crappy phone and I hang on to this phone because I don't believe in wasting money and one of the things I don't do is buy phones when my phone works perfectly fine. Now, though, it's starting to be a problem. I dropped it, and the screen is cracked, and the screen protector that I got from Phil, my buddy Phil, that puts he puts it on there, and it really does help, is gone, and it cracked it. So the day after I took it off, it cracked it. Man, this chair is squeaking, making weird noise. Do we have WD-40 in here? I don't think I so. I use some of that. The text telling me to tell him to bring it so I can spray it on this chair so it doesn't sound weird. Um. Yeah, so that's what's going on. Here we go, 300 people. So we, we don't allow for rewind, but I found out last night on the UAP uh, show, which was awesome. We had Rob Yox back, and who else was on there? Christopher Jordan was our guest, and Christopher James was the uh, was the other host. He's been co-hosting with me every every uh, Saturday. Next Saturday. It's going to be those three same guys, but we're going to throw Jason Bland in there, too. And, oh, it's going to be awesome. And then the next week, we're going to have Michael Anthony. If you don't know who he is, you will. He's a good guy who knows a lot about a lot of stuff, and it's going to be a good show. And uh, I got a message today. Somebody who said from last night's show, they said, I thought you were a little hard on Corey Good. And I said, really? I don't, I don't know what you mean. He said that I said a couple things about people like, I'm not dogpiling on the guy. 
Okay. But I will say this, and this is all I'm going to say about it. He committed some serious hoaxing infractions. Okay. And I take hoaxing and fraud and all that other stuff very seriously. I don't do it. And I don't think others should be participating in it or be a part of it. Now, this person wanted to go on to say that they think that maybe he got railroaded or he's being forced to do this, forced to do that, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And then they said, oh, it could happen to you. It could happen to anybody. Maybe so, maybe not. But from what I know, and I know a lot of people who, who are in that field, in the UFO community, I know a bunch of people. Okay. Trust me. I know what I'm talking about when I say I do not believe this guy. Now, you, as the audience, can take it for what you want, you know, and then the guy who hoaxed a picture of a, of a towel rack with the Bigfoot thing. Oh, really? That was cute. Right? Who does that? And then it just happens to be a big gorilla, well, Matt, okay, a big gorilla-faced being just happened to be there. Oh, I didn't see it when I took the picture. Then why would you take a picture of empty blackness, a towel rack, while you're sitting out inside of a hot tub? Who does that? Hey, I was going to take my phone and see if this towel rag has a... Let's see if a demon appears. <laughs> oh, my gosh, it did. Woo, look at that. Oh, my God, this, there's a demon right there. Demon, right there. Let me take my shirt off and yell at it. Maybe I'll get a TV show. Ridiculous. It is ridiculous. And so I was like, that's ridiculous. I just call it like I see it. That's it. Sometimes I make mistakes, sometimes I don't, but I'm pretty sure they're full of, you know, some type of, of feces. It's just my opinion. And I'm sorry that you got upset with me because I said something about people who, um, yeah, the person at LF Prime, Corey Good has admitted on videos, it's just stories, his intellectual property. They were trying to argue that they put him through the ringer, so he had to say that. So that if anybody brings it up, he can sue them. Okay, like they were like, "Oh, they're just ma they're making him do this," and so he had he's using this as a protection to sue them, so that they 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 can't attack him. Really, you believe that? Please don't tell me you believe that. That's his defense. He's like, "Oh, I'm gonna get these people off of me," so I'm just gonna say. That I made that all up and to save myself, and then I'm going to sue people who say that if they talk about it, whatever. I, okay, whatever, you know, and somebody really argued, wanted to argue. And I'm, I'm going to be nice and not say your name. I'm not going to say these people's names because it's not worth it. It's just ridiculous. Quez McIntyre, a little off topic, but do you think just, just hoaxing is good for weight loss or should I stack... What did he say? How, how, what? How he might have meant dieting, been, been autocorrected to whatever that is. Maybe. I don't know. Well, I don't know. If you're trying to lose weight, lifting weights will burn fat up to 15% and more in some cases. Boxing. You said boxing. Oh. Uh, okay. Boxing will melt well, boxing fat right will off Boxing will knock of you. it right off of you, dude. I mean... Heck, just standing there coaching people makes you tired. I mean, <laughs> you know, if I was still doing that, I'd probably be, like, down a few pounds or whatever. But lifting will definitely and, – and a lot of people, the boxing, they they don't lift. Like Coach Scipio. Yeah. He doesn't believe in lifting weights, although he's built like, you know. Yeah. But – that that's not my opinion. I don't believe that. I've known a lot of great boxers who lifted, but they kept it far enough apart from when they had to actually throw punches. Mm -hmm. You don't want to be lifting weights and then try to throw punches later on that in the, in the next hour. No. You might be, be, you know, but then, then again, you might pull something. Well, and how you lift is is uh, plays a big role too, because like a lot of uh, a lot of people who come from like uh, combat sports backgrounds, they're, they're people who who've spent their lives like doing just that. And so when you when they think of uh, like like when you say uh, weightlifting, they think like Arnold Schwarzenegger like bodybuilding you know contest type lifting. That's a, that's a whole different thing. Like if if they're if they're thinking of like like if they tell you all oh, you can't lift weights and and do this boxing or do this MMA, what yeah, they're probably talking about powerlifting. Yeah. Or bodybuilding. Well, I mean, yeah, they're thinking of bodybuilding, but strength training 
is good for everything. Like stronger is always better. No matter what anyone tells you, bigger is not always better, but stronger is always better. So yeah, but you can't get strength training is like the, the best thing you can you do. You can't get stronger without getting bigger. That's a fact. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, people are, I'm a big guy. That's, I mean, my strength is apparent. I mean, if you go to the gym and I've taken the videos and I've shown people, um, again, to my wife's chagrin, she's not happy about that, but she also thinks I'm a little more frail than I am because she loves me and she worries. And I tell her, I said, honey, this is not heavy for me. It's like a, a, when a horse, you get on a horse's back, the horse isn't dying from you being on the bed. It's like wearing a hat. Okay. Um, it's, it's not that bad. You know, you're, they're, they're very powerful animals. And when I lift, um, and I'm going to say this, and I, I did this on uh, Thursday. I got on there. Um, and when I got to 40 on, I was doing the decline and I got to 48 on the decline with 225. And I don't care who believes me or not. There's a, there again, that was, that would have been it's real simple. I can make another video and show you. And in fact, my, that's not even my record on the decline. My record is like 55 or something like that. So I could go in fresh for sure. That, that, that's after I've already done my, up my incline and my regular bench. I could go in fresh and show you. I could show you. Um, it's no skin off my nose. I mean, especially if I go in fresh, I can do anything in there and lift whatever. Anthony's a witness. There's been a lot of people that work out in there, and I've gotten their stories. And, in fact, one of the stories I got recently was really good. Um, the guy that was wearing the Metallica shirt. Yeah. Yeah. His, uh, his name is Brandon, too. It's funny. There's somebody named Brandon. But Brandon gave me a story. Lifting is not hard for me. It is hard when you do a lot of reps. I do a lot of reps, and I do it with with weight that most people would bang out maybe three, four reps on. This is not a joke, and I'm not making this up. I don't care what anybody says. I can do 40, 30, whatever reps with weight that most people can only bang out maybe five, six, maybe 10 if they're really strong. And this guy said, well, that would put you in the top two, whatever. I said, then put me there. <laughs> put me there. Because there's been hundreds of people who've seen me do it. Hundreds. And I've been doing this since I was in my 20s. Now, I'll admit, when I was in my 20s, I was not as strong as I am now. That's, I know. But it's from years and years of dedication to lifting. It just makes you stronger and stronger and stronger. Mm -hmm. And when I was in my 20s, there were a lot of guys that were stronger than me. But I never took the juice. They always took juice. I never did that. I never did that. And I just kept growing and kept getting bigger and bigger. And then I'd see them later off of their cycles and they looked like shriveled up, looked horrible. I was like, geez, what happened? You have some kind of disease? No, I just, I'm not cycling right now. Oh, yeah, I could see that. Well, slow and steady wins the race. All right. So, folks, let me, let's me let get started here. I have a story for you that this is what, what was going on. Today, I was reminded of a story that I got. Um, from a friend of mine's grandmother. And, it, you know, and then, when I started back thinking about it, I was like, I had to stop and I had to go and ask myself. And I was going to tell this on the show one day, but I couldn't remember whether I told it or not. So at the risk of being redundant, repetitive, whatever, I'm going to go ahead and tell you there's two stories. And I tried talking, I tried asking my brother the other day about it. Um, and him and Scorpion don't remember whether I had told them or not. They can't tell you. In fact, see if they're in the chat. Can you get them yeah. um, just to, to do the moderating, whatever? Um, if, unless they're busy with their rounds or whatever. But it, I was wondering because, and I can't, I couldn't, I can't remember whether or not I told this or not. But because the, the show is now go what five years old. Yeah. We're, we're like five now, right? It'll be what? What is it? Nineteen to 20, 20, 20, 20, 21, 21, 22, 22, 23, 23, 24. Yeah, like five years. So in April. In April, it will be, I think it was like two to two or three days after my mom's birthday when we started. So five years, a lot of stories have been told. A lot of encounters have been repeated. From people who's given us encounters, stories, whatever. And so, you know, sometimes you lose track. But I have a couple, and I'm pretty sure I haven't told these before. One of them, I'm po almost positive. But if I, if I did talk about it before, sorry, you know. But here it is. Um, there's there's three that I'd like to talk about in particular. And I don't know how much you guys 
want or what you want of, of how much of each subject. But I got quite a few dogman stories and I've kind of been fill, you know, building them up because I wanted to throw them out on Tuesdays and then put them on Sundays and then get them out there. Um, but you don't want to give up all your, your stories and then you got to, you know, whatever. So here's, here's this one. And this isn't a dogman story, but I'll start off with this one. And what this one was, was an old roommate of ours, mine and Scorpion and, and uh, my brother. We had a roommate who lived with us for a while. And he his family was from uh, uh, Pa'a, not Papua New Guinea. Uh, oh, man, I can't remember the name of it. Oh, God, it's on the tip of my tongue. Oh, okay. Anyway, it's a, it's a South American country. Guyana? Guyana. There you go. It's, it was called it was uh, Dutch Guiana, okay. Dutch Guiana. There you go. Thank you. And, and anyway, his his grandmother told me a really weird story. And it's weird because when I started, when I right, right when I decided I was going to do my own business, my own company, I was finishing up a. Con I was working for a contract, and little did I know, I was actually finishing up the the last days of working for another company and I never worked for another company again it always was straight up you know in my thing other than the company I work for now which briefly I worked for them after I had sold out and then I bought back in it's a whole weird convoluted thing so in 2006 I had just finished working a contract at a, at a very uh, haunted uh, a place that they were building a construction site and I had pictures from that place I interviewed other guards that had, that had heard things and seen things I talked to the workers and I did inventory every day of the lumber of the, everything we were very strict there and I worked for a guy named snake he's a snake man that's what we call him he's in the Guinness Book of World Records I still I think he still is for laying in a coffin full of rattlesnakes he didn't get bit uh, amazing guy, I and mean, I've, I've seen him. And we have a we, do we still have the video of him kissing a cobra? Oh, I don't a think a hooded I have cobra. He kissed it on the back of its head. Mm -hmm. Amazing dude. Okay, and so anyway, I was working for him, and after that ended, there was about uh, two two weeks where I didn't have a lot of work. I was just barely getting by, and I just was. But I was tired. I was wore out. I was working every day because they had fired the other guard for sleeping, and so I ended up having to work every day. And when that contract ended, I was wore out. I was exhausted spiritually, mentally, physically, everything. There was a lot of weird stuff that happened there. Um, there were people that I worked with that that place made them a believer in the, the weird, the weirdness. I lived with a guy who was a devout atheist who came to my site and said, there's something wrong in this place. And we saw some shadow things moving around. He saw them. My friend Bones went there and took a picture and got a weird, what looked like a like a sideways eye. You know how an eye would look if it was like that, you know? Like your eye turns, you know? Weird stuff. And so what ended up happening, I was tired. I was very wore out. And so I went to my boss at that time, a really nice guy. His name was John Jackson. And I said... Jackson, I said, John, Mr. Jackson, I said, can you, I've been working with him for years at three different companies. And I said, can you give me an assignment that's pretty relaxed? I don't want to be in, I don't want to deal with this construction thing where, you know, somewhere he goes, well, I have another construction place that's way out there by the lake. And I was like, I, I don't want to, I don't want to deal with the construction place. And he goes, no, no. He's like, it's just a lady that's building a house. That's it. And I said, where? And he told me. I said, oh, okay, that's out there by the lake. I said, okay, that's peaceful. It's a long drive from where I was living, but you know what? I wanted to do it. He said it was only going to be for another month or whatever. And I figured out why, because when I talked to this lady, she said the security is very expensive, and I'm not going to be able to keep you guys around. And so I thought about it, and I was like, well, what if I just came and sat and did it for you? You know, and so I went to my, my boss and he was about to retire. So he told me everything I needed to do to get my ducks in a row to, to do that. And I did. And um, 
So I had this lady that I worked with up until that the old company that, that I worked for, which would would really be the last company that I ever worked for that I didn't have my own business. And that was back in 2006, oh, December, late December 2006. We finished out 2006, and in 2007, I took over. And my newly minted business was, was born. The lady that I worked with was a very sweet lady. She looked African-American, but she really wasn't. She was from Dutch Guiana. But she was very uh, good, good, good person, whatever. And little did I know that I was actually talking to my former roommate's grandmother. And I had actually met her once before. And she acted like she knew me, but she didn't tell me from where. And then one day she brought some food and she was always being very nice and sweet. She brought me some food. She actually didn't like my roommate. (laughs) She did not like him. She had a problem with him. He did some things, not to us, but to her and, and, and his mother really made them mad. And so thank you, Clough, for that donation. Uh, how you doing? Clough's got a channel called Paranormal Drama. And what's his channel called? It's right there on the screen. It doesn't say. <laughs> oh, and thing. Sorry, sorry. Okay, I was looking at this side here. <laughs> Sorry, Clough, your channel, and I don't, I don't really watch it, but he does do a lot of stuff defending PRT, and I really appreciate that. And Clough, paranormal drama, and things. Thank you. Can't remember everybody's channel. I can remember the stories. Okay, so here's the thing. She starts talking to me one day, and we we start having this conversation about aliens and abduction because she had seen what she believed was a UFO out there. While I was working out there, there were two other people who claimed to have seen stuff, people that lived out there, and one was a guard that worked on an adjacent property named Mike, who I actually knew, and he was who became my second client. He was the helicopter pilot slash bodyguard for that guy. He was a very wealthy guy, still very well known here in Austin, like I say his name, and he was my second client that I ever had independently on my own. So... They told me these stories. They had seen things. One person had seen a pale creature crawling around, all this stuff, you know. Uh, one of my guards saw something that looked like what the way he described it was an alien, pale, whatever, moving around on, by the bridge. You remember him? No, Phillip. yeah. His name was Philip. Um, and then uh, several other people. My brother, Scorpion Bones, everybody was seeing stuff out there. I saw shadows. I didn't really see anything else, and I, I'm, I can't say I did. I just, I didn't doubt, but I did see a cougar run in front of my, my truck one day, and I'm talking, he was big boy. Um, and I saw a smaller uh, one that, that, you know, had to have been, you know, I don't know. It was There were two different things I'd seen. So I saw some things. I saw red and, and gray foxes out there, uh, lemurs, lemurs. And there's not a lot of red foxes around here in Texas, but they were there. They were, there was one out there, a reddish-brown one. It's real pretty. So those are the things I saw. But I did have a couple weird experiences. And I don't know what you would classify them as. But anyway, at the beginning of this contract, I was there for about a month, month and a half, I guess, a month and a half. And um, this woman tells me a story. She says, yeah. She's like, I've been seeing UFOs since I was a child. And when she told me where she was from, because of her accent, I really was kind of thrown off. My friend that lived that lived with us, he didn't have an accent. And she was like, she goes, yeah, I'm not going to say his name, but your his name is starts with a B. She goes, you're B's old roommate. And I'm like, yeah. And then I looked at her, and I thought about it, and I think I only met her one time, and I was drunk. <laughs> because it was in my 20s and I drank all the time and partied and did all kinds of stuff. And I said, you look familiar. I was like, are you? I was like, oh, you're his mother. She goes, no, I'm his grandmother. His mother and his grandmother looked like they could be sisters. Oh, wow. And, I, and so I was like, oh, okay. I was like, I met you, met you one time before on his birthday. And she said, yeah. And she's like, you remember the story I told you? And honestly, I couldn't tell her I did because I, like I said, I was drinking. I said, I don't remember. She's like, she goes, you know, my daughter, she likes to gamble. And in fact, her daughter gambled away all of her winnings from the lottery. Oh, man. I kid you not. She won the lottery. 
And then, and then, you know, a few years, it was gone. She gambled it away. Oh, well, that's life. But And that's why her mother was working. She mm-hmm. wasn't bitter about it, though. She had a nice van. She had, like, a van, and there was a nice little setup in there and everything. And she was always inviting me in, but, you know, for a tea party, whatever, in the van. And it was like a little table. And I said, I'm too big to really fit in your van. But thank you for the food. I appreciate it. And she would just talk, talk away. And she says, you know, one time we were talking about UFOs and ghosts. And she says, I I went to Diamond Jack. Is it casino? I said, yeah, yeah, I know, I know. She says, I go there. She says, it is in Louisiana. I can't remember whether it was in Bossier or she said it was Lake Charles, one of those. Anyway. Diamond Jack is in Bossier City. Bossier, right? Yeah. yeah. She says, I go there. I go there to the casino. She's like, sometimes we go to Oklahoma. Sometimes I go with my daughter to Las Vegas. They were going a lot. Like, she was a gambler. And this is after she'd already spent her money. So they like to go to the casino. And she says, I don't do a lot of gamble, but my daughter does, you know. And she says, one time I was asleep. At the casino. And she's like, I was in my room. And my daughter was asleep in the other bed. And we were there to meet some friends. And she's like, and I'm laying in the bed. And I, I see the light. I, she's like, I go to close my eyes. It's dark. And I, I open my eyes because I couldn't sleep. She says, and I see the light on in the bathroom. And she's like, why is the light on in the bathroom? She's like, and I see something moving back and forth. And I said, what color was it? She goes, no, just like dark shape, like a shadow, just something. I don't know what, but a person, like a person. And I said, okay. <clears throat> and she's like, and like I said, if I've told the story before, I apologize. You know, but it's, it's you know. So anyways, she says, and, and I'm laying there in my bed. She's like, and this thing comes from outside the door and she could speak English. She just had an accent, you know, and she's like, it was a green ball. And it hovered there in the room. And she's like, and I looked up at it and I was like, what am I looking at? She's like, I don't know what I'm looking at. She's like, I was scared. She goes, I was so scared. I covered my head. I couldn't even yell to my, to my, my daughter, just say, Hey, you know, I'm terrified. And she's like, and as I'm, I'm laying there contemplating, you know, she, not her words, mine, but she said, I'm thinking, and I'm figuring, you know, she's contemplating. <clears throat> she's like, am I going to die? What is this thing doing? Because it was getting really close, and I could feel this heat from it. She's like, and I began to pray, and I prayed, and I prayed. She's like, and I look, and it's gone. And she's like, and then the, then the morning comes. She's like, I couldn't sleep. And the morning comes, I'm really tired. And she's like, and I, I wanted to tell my daughter, but for some reason, I just, I couldn't bring myself to talk about it. She's like, so we're at breakfast. She's like, and we're eating. And I keep thinking about it. I keep thinking about it. And I didn't want to go up to the room. She's like, and then it got later. And one of my friends was still on the floor, on the casino floor. So I wasn't even playing anymore. She was, but I wanted to hang out. I didn't want to go upstairs. She's like, and my daughter's like, I'm going to go up there. And she goes, and I felt like I should go up with her. She's like, I felt like something was going to happen. I didn't know what. And so she didn't. She stayed down with her friend while she played Caribbean Stud, which is this type of card game. Don't play it. Trust me, you lose. (laughs) And at least I do. (laughs) So I don't play it. But anyway, she said they were down there playing. And she said that her daughter goes upstairs and she's like, I felt like I needed to go be with her, but I was so afraid. She said, I stayed out of the hotel room all day. It was 11 o'clock at night. She'd been downstairs since like 10 a.m. She's like, I didn't want to go up. My daughter's like, I'm tired. I'm going to go sleep for a while. She said, finally, a couple of hours go by. She goes into the room and her daughter is huddled up against the headboard of the bed, basically with her covers over her head, terrified, not wanting to to get up, not wanting to do anything. And when she went over there to touch her, she screamed. And she's like, and me and my friend, she's like, we were like, what's wrong? What's wrong? And so we went downstairs with her and she 
sat down, drank some water. She's like, and we had coffee, and my daughter just sat there with her water, and she's like, I can't go back up. We need another room. We need another room. She could finally talk about it. What she says happened would terrify anybody. She said she was laying there with the TV on, just kind of watching, getting ready to drift off to sleep. They had a nice room. It was just sweet. And she said that uh, she sees something on the left side of the bed. She looks, and at first she thinks it's a man, it's like a shadow. But then she looks at it and directly on, and it's a ball of light, a green ball of light. And it kind of moved, and it went around. This is exactly what the woman did when she told me this story. And it went around the other side of the bed, and then it dropped down below where she could visibly see it. So she sits up in bed, and she's looking. And she's trying to observe, like, what is that? Where did that go? She's like, and then she, she looks on one side, the left side. She didn't see it. She, then she goes to look at the other side, and there she sees something black, completely black, that either had its head tucked down to where she couldn't see the head, or it was headless. It was like a headless humanoid shape yeah. crawling toward her on that side of the bed. And... She was so gripped with fear, like she turned and she she didn't look at it. She she couldn't look at it, and then she finally, she couldn't bring herself to get up off of the bed because she thought it was going to grab her. She said, "I just could not breathe." She's like, "I almost passed out because I couldn't breathe. I couldn't exhale. I couldn't inhale." She said it was horrifying. So she just laid there. So then she says, they get another room. She takes her daughter and says, fine, let's go get another room. And they had some people to go up and get their stuff and then take it to the new room. Well, she said about two years later after this had happened, that they went to a big, big party, whatever, with some friends of theirs, and a friend of theirs told them that they used to like to go with them and gamble with them. They said, oh, yeah. The one time when we were at that particular place, we had an incident with a weird ball of light that, that bounced around in the parking lot. And I thought that was interesting that my grandmother years ago She'd had a few experiences in her life. One of them was at a casino, but this was in Lake Charles. And I can't remember exactly which one it was. I think it was Tropical Isle, I'm not 100%. And she said that she saw a ball of light come into her hotel room. But I think she said it was like yellow. And it was just there. Then it went out into the parking lot. But I'm pretty sure it was a different casino, but that is weird. That is weird. Now, here's the interesting thing that I'm going to tell you, if that's not interesting enough. I have worked in a casino years ago, years ago, back in the 90s. And it was pretty uneventful. I didn't have a lot of problems. There was a guy there that told me, he says, you know, you know the people that run these casinos, like they're, they're, they're evil. And I was like, well, what do you mean? I mean, I was a young guy. He says, you know, they're all, they worship mammon. At that time, being like all of whatever I was, 20 or 21, whatever, he said, they worship mammon. And he was an African-American guy. He was a pretty smart guy. I think his name was Arnold. Mm -hmm. Or no, not Arnold, uh, Harold. And I told Harold, I said, I said well, who's, who's that? Who, what is, who's that? And he said, he is the God of money. And he said, my family, they come from Africa, from West Africa, the Ivory Coast, which later on in my life, I would get to know some people from there. And he said, you know, in the Ivory Coast, we believe that he lives in the ocean between here and North America. 
you know, or from where I'm from. He said, between Africa and North America. And I said, wow. I said, tell me, tell me more about this, whatever. He said, well, when we were children, we were told not to play in the ocean because there were two demons, as you call them. One belonged to the sea. The other one was the god of money. He basically lived under the ocean. I said, under the ocean? He said, yes. He said, this one demon will take you and drown you. And then it'll take you to the other demon, which will basically use your soul. And he couldn't really, you know, tell me any more than that. But that was enough to freak me out. I was like, whoa. And I thought, man, that guy's freaking crazy. Don't talk to him anymore. <laughs> I kind of halfway thought that. But then I thought about what had been, what, what I had been through just up to that point in my life. And so I opened up to him one day after our shift ended. And we got together. Then these casinos were huge. They're like little cities, you know, whatever. And so I went and we sat down in one of the little coffee shops. And he bought me breakfast. He was a nice guy. And he talked to me about what he believes, what kind of demons inhabit these places like a casino. And what he told me, yeah, it's the Aramaic term for wealth. So what he told me was very weird. He said when he was growing up as a child, his dad had a friend who was basically a witch, a warlock, and he performed magic ceremonies, and he was able to produce American dollars, not counterfeit, real American dollars, like $100 bills from ceremonies. He goes, but it required blood, like blood magic. And he said, he goes, and I end up living here. He goes, I get married. He's like, I get married and I end up living here in Las Vegas and I never thought I would be here living here. <clears throat> he goes, I don't gamble. And I knew he didn't because sometimes after, you know, when I was off, I'd go across the street to the casino or um, you couldn't, st the rule at that time, I think you couldn't stay there and gamble. Like after you couldn't just take your shirt off and go to the floor and gamble. You couldn't do that. Um, so you would have to come in on the time when you were a designated day, I believe, or something. That was the house rules, I think. I don't think that was like the, the board's rules or anything. But I like to gamble across the, 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 the road at another casino. And so I would go over there and shoot dice. And sometimes I'd see some of the guards in there and we'd be talking and hanging out and whatever. And um, he never, I never saw him gamble, ever. And he wouldn't do it. He says, I don't gamble. And then he told me, he says... When, when I was a kid, he goes, the, we, we, we needed money. He's like, so you could take the blood of like an animal or a person, whatever. He goes, but ultimately you would have to do something to someone to get something out of it. And he said that we were told that in order to do this, you had to commune with this demon from the ocean. And I don't know if it's true or not. And then there's actually a book that's been written about it. And uh, I can't remember the name of it. I ordered the book and I never got to read it. It's called like the, the Witch Doctor and the Sea or something like that. Maybe you can look it up, Anthony. I don't know. But um, yeah, it's a book that was basically written about, you know, this guy who was a boy who was taken under the ocean and to, to meet these demons by a very powerful practitioner of, of you know, black magic. This guy that I worked with, he was that kind of person who was like very superstitious, believed 100% in all that, and he had witnessed it. And he said his dad was a very evil man, and one day they, he found out that his dad was responsible for the killing of another person, and that was so they could have money. There's a book called The Witch Doctor and the Man, City Under the Sea. The Witch Doctor and the Man, City Under the Sea. I haven't got to read it yet. But it was recommended to me years ago by another friend. So I got that book and, um, probably two or three months ago and just got way too much going on at the time to read it. 
But this this guy was telling me this stuff, and I remember this, and I remember him telling me. And, and most people don't take the time to try to even listen to people who talk about this kind of stuff. And thank goodness I did. But he told me about the casinos, and he says, dude, the, the spirit of mammon is all in these casinos. It's really bad. And most people can't. They can't handle it. You know, they can't. They'll they'll just spend their money. They'll go through it, whatever. And some people can. Some people can go. I can go to the casino with a set amount, and that's it. When I'm done, I'm done. I don't come back over broke and, oh, my gosh, I don't, I don't have a car now. Can I, you know, I don't go to the ATM. I don't do yeah. that. You know, you have your fun, and that's it. You know, if you make it, you make it. You don't, you don't. Most of the time, you don't. But when I was a young man... I did like to gamble, and I was beginning to spend a little too much time drinking and hanging out in the casino, and he gave me that advice. He says, don't give mammon your money. And so I did learn, and I've all since working in one and also now knowing what I know, I can tell you this. Thank you for that donation. We do need the good camera. We do. Appreciate Liberty always coming through. But I did learn this. There in, in all these casinos, there's all these hotels, some of these casinos, a lot of weird stuff happens. People see a lot of weird stuff. Balls of light in particular. And they see things that you would think would probably be demons, something like that. And there was a guy who actually gave me a story. <clears throat> oh. And he talked about something that happened to him in Atlantic City, in a, in a hotel, which Atlantic City's Las Vegas East, back before everything, every state but us, had a casino. And I would like to get him on the show and have him retell that story. Now, I did, I remember telling that story. It was a story that was given to me, and it was about these reptilians in, a, in an elevator. Weird stuff, but it doesn't surprise me coming from a place where you go and spend your money to try to make more money. But that, this, you know, if you're somebody that's listening out there, you know, and you have a story about the casino, maybe something out, I'm thinking about doing a show about it. Because we also heard of a story of a casino where there were Bigfoot sightings behind the casino. And there was another one where that we got where people were seeing uh, what had to be a werewolf-ish dogman type creature running around. And then my cousin Trey came on, talked about the Wind River Reservation, the casino there, people seeing the clown, the weird clown thing. You know, demons are going to be where they're going to be, but they're really going to be in places where, you know, nightclubs. Believe me, I've spent a lot of time in nightclubs and bars and casinos. And they're places of ill repute, really. You know, I mean, they should be. But we still go there. You still do it. You still have fun there, you know. And they've made them to where it's like family friendly now, these casinos. No. And I'm not bashing, you know, going and, and, and playing every now and then. I do believe everything in moderation. <clears throat> but how hard is it for people to resist? And one of the worst is strip clubs, I can tell you that. And I'm not one to sit up here on a soapbox and be like, oh, I'm a holy man. No, I'm not. But I feel really dark, bad energy from a strip club. It makes me ill. And it also it makes you, I don't know, man. It's like... You feel sorry for the people working there. Even the bartenders and, and, and the waitresses, you're just like, dude, this is, it's just gross. It's gross. 
and I'm not judging, but I've felt some really dark energy from those places. One of my friends used to run one down in San Antonio. And um, one day he saw something black come out of the back of a woman's spine. This isn't a guy who was in the paranormal at all. He didn't have any kind of whatever. But he told me and my brother a very weird story. He says, I was there, and there was this black goo-type stuff that came out the back of this girl's spine. When she got really mad at another girl, he goes, and I could see her eyes were all black. And he goes, and this stuff just kind of was floating in the air. He goes, and three of us saw it. It was like this thick black goo, and then it kind of dissipated into smoke. Weird. Weird stuff. She attacked the other girl and tried to stab her with a stiletto heel multiple times and didn't wasn't successful. She was a little skinny girl, and he said they were able to get her under control and throw her out. But, um, yeah, and working in nightclubs too, man. I mean, it was, there were, there was just, sometimes it was gross. It was just, you just go home and you just feel dirty just being in there and being around all that crap. So, you know, I'm just telling you, you know, people go and hang out in these places. Talk to some of these bartenders, man. Go into these places and talk to the bartenders. Didn't the girl that we that we went to get our sandwiches the other day, the bar the bartender, didn't she say something about it? She had an encounter. Yeah. She had something. Yeah, she worked at some bar downtown. It's really haunted. The hole in the wall. Yeah. That's where she was working. But that's not where we were at. But she, we went into a place to get our food, and there was a bar there. And she said, I work in the hole in the wall. It's very, very haunted. I've heard weird stories about that place. There was one that Squid used to work at where people, he has a, he needs to come on the show and talk about some of the creepy stuff that went on where he was at. <clears throat> a place called Buffalo Billiards. Can you give me some water? Yeah. He's on that side, folks, and it's closer to the fridge, okay? I don't want to have to get up and go around all this whatever. Not ordering him around and abusing people, as they try to say. Oh, he's mean to people. He, whatever. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Trust me. You're going to do something right. Gets mad tonight. What? Oh, nothing. I was talking about somebody. Um, anyway. <laughs> no one says, I saw worms come out of a girl's head after she did some Molly at a music festival. What were, well, were you sober? Um, no one, because if you're not, that could account for the seeing things. Yeah, and I'm not telling people to not go to a casino. I like to go to the Choctaw Casino. It's a very family-oriented place. I mean, and I haven't had any weird things happen. I did talk to a guy that, that told me a story of what could be called a skinwalker. Yes, I'm very well aware, you know, the, the, the paranormal powers that be. Skinwalkers are actually Navajo, and I'm so sick of people who talk about skinwalkers and they don't use them in the proper way. Yes, okay, thank you, walking law of the land. I saw somebody post that crap on their Facebook the other day. I'm not going to say any names, but shut up, okay? The, you know, the, that's like saying, oh, I called it a Coke. Sorry, it's not a Coke. It was, uh, you know, a Shasta version of a cola or whatever. Sorry, I called it a Coke. Nobody really cares except for Barton Nunley, who may jump on you because he loves Coke. And not the, that sounded horrible. He loves Coca Cola. Uh -huh. He likes to drink it. Right? So, you know, I don't know what my future holds. I may go to the Choctaw. I've never had any weird vibes or felt anything bad there. But the day that it happens, I'm done. I'm never, you know, I haven't been there in two years. But um, certain areas, especially near the bars and stuff like that. You just feel, 
I don't know. And then when you sit, if you if you ever if you're real sensitive to it, I am. You go to sit at like the blackjack table, or any of the poker tables, or the roulette table, or whatever, and you got these people next to you, around you. Sometimes they're friendly. Sometimes they're just like. And, they, and and there are these people that are well practiced and they know everything about it. Oh yeah, it's annoying. They get mad at you when they're you're like, like, "You need to come on and be a, an addicted gambler like me." Why are yeah. you now? You're taking too long. And I'm like, dude, I do this twice a year for fun, right? I'm not like you. I have not hit rock bottom, and I have not decided to make it my life to try to win my money back or at least make enough off of this table to go buy a sandwich. Sorry. I got on to one guy. He just was, you know, so rude. He's like, "You going? You going to shoot? What are you going to do?" You know, and I'm like, cause we were throwing, you know, the dice. Or whatever. I said, "I don't like to shoot. I like to bet against, you know, whatever." And he's like, "Well, your kind of guy brings bad luck." You know, he's <laughs> he's up there, and I was looking at him, and I was like, "You're so lucky that there's like security here because you're really starting to aggravate me." You know. So then when he goes to shoot and I put the money down against him, you know, that's, that's where the smart money would go, really. And uh, he lost because, I mean, you know, you got to hit certain numbers and it wasn't hitting it. And I, I, you think as much as he appeared to be gambling, he was down there every day. He told me he lived there. Not there, but at the casino. But <laughs> he, lived up in the, he lived up in the shafts. No, he lived in the city. And I was like, oh, so you're here all the time with your what you make a living. And then... You put enough aside, hopefully, to eat and buy cigarettes, and then you go to the the casino. And you... So, anyway, what's up, Tony? Make sure it's working. Sit down. So, um, don't let, let me boss you around, tell you what to do. Uh, but he, he was sitting there telling me, you know, like the casino, he was like, you know, I was being, I was giving him bad luck. And I'm like, well, the luck's really good for me because you've been throwing them dice and you've been not doing too good. And so betting against you was working for me. And then when I left the table and I went to go do something else, I'm standing over there by the bar. He comes walking up and he's like, he, he leans on the bar like, he's staring at me like this is some old Western movie or something, you know? And he's like, thanks. Thanks a lot, buddy. You're I just welcome. wanted to tell you thanks. Anytime. He's moving his mouth around, you know. I don't know what he was on. I was like, I was like, yeah, thank you. And I, and I was like, yeah, I got all these chips now. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. And he goes, yeah, uh huh. He kept walking around, turning around, looking at me, walking around, turning around, looking at me, walking away, whatever. And I was like, watching this guy. And then the bartender lady says, she comes up to me. She tells me this. This was years. It was like twenty years ago. And she says, that guy, he's got demons on him. I'm like, like real demons? She goes, I don't know. She goes, I'm just assuming. So look at the way he acts. She's like, he comes in here and when he wants to drink, he never tips. And he wants to drink and he's always real specific. And then he gets mad. And then he's like, well, I should have just waited for it on the floor. You know, and she's like, well, maybe you should have. You know, I was a very, very annoying guy. And I was just like, that's the kind of people that—that's why they have security because people like him that act a fool when they get mad and they lose, but he's in there every day. But God help those people because they're addicted to this. So I started talking to the bartender and I asked her. I said, "Have you ever, you know, like had anything weird happen?" She's like, "Not really." She's like, "I just do my job and I work for tips, which is kind of what we do here, right? These are tips, really." I guess Rumble Rumble calls them tips. Mm -hmm. They said, you keep 80% of your tips. <laughs> cool. I just call it donations, but let's call it what it is. You're giving me a tip because I'm doing a good job. So if I'm not doing a good job, I guess I'm not getting tips. I don't know. But she said, she was, I just I just try to get my tips and go home. She's like, I've seen some weird stuff, though. People acting just completely weird and irrational because of losing money and they get they get freaked out. And one guy, she said, this is the only weird thing I remember her saying, which is maybe paranormal, maybe not. But she said, there was a guy sitting at the bar and he told her, give him, give me this type of drink, whatever. I remember what it was, like a double rum and coke or something. 
he comes back up there and he slaps the, the table and he's like, thanks a lot. Whatever you put in that rum and coke, yeah, I just lost like two hundred dollars and like walked. Huh. Like, oh yeah. Like like she did that. Like she cursed him with the drink, you know. And she's like, okay. I should have ordered something else. So, you know, it, it, it's it's a it's a weird thing, right? It's a very weird thing. I know that when we were at the casino one time, and it was me and Tony and my brother. There was the guy that worked up there and told us a very weird story about something that happened to him involving what may or may not have been a skinwalker. And once again, and it's the last time I'm going to say this right now, um, yes, I get it. It's a Navajo term. Doesn't mean that there aren't shapeshifters from other native tribes because they all have them. And then somebody tried to argue with me in the group the other day, one of the Bigfoot groups, and they were talking. They were getting, you know, I, I'm, I'm okay with some weird, but they were getting weird to, in a way that I was like, okay, I'm out of here, dude. All right, it was just getting too stupid for me. I was, I was like, you know, Bigfoot come from a certain star or a system, and then it was, you know, I was like, okay, yeah, whatever. Planet B612, sure, whatever. And so sometimes it just gets too much, you know, and you don't know who these people, what these people are doing. And so I kind of was getting aggravated, and I was trying to, to to remember the name of the, and it's not the Gugwe, uh, but the other one, uh, the Stone Giants, or what are they called? The um, Rock Ape? No, they put, they put the, 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 the rock on their chest, like with tree sap, supposedly. Yeah, I thought that was like the... The name's... The... Uh, rock ape, the gugwee. No, nah, the gugwee. There's there's a name for it. It's a. If anybody in the chat can tell me, because I could not remember the name of it to save my life, and everybody was arguing over the name of it. Genosqua. Genosqua, and everybody was arguing about it. Thank you. I'm so thankful that you you remember that Genosqua. And everybody was calling it everything but that, and I was like, never mind. And then, but but they were talking about the origins of it and where it could come from. And some people were like, it's a monkey, a giant ape. And other people were like, it's from a sp another planet. It's a Chewbacca. And I was just like, this is caca. And I, I left. <laughs> I was tired of the arguing, and I couldn't remember the name of the damn thing. So, um, yeah, Genosqua, that's right. So I'm sitting there trying to remember, and I'm, like, not remembering, which is, you know, usually, you know, but I just, when you're dealing with a thousand things a day, Sometimes you just blank out, you know. So here's another, another story I'm going to tell you, another encounter I'm going to tell you. And I don't know if I've told this one um, or not either. Um, but um, <laughs> this is caca. <laughs> um, before I do, though, let me, let me ask the audience, like, what do you guys want to hear? I mean, because I, I came prepared with a little a little bit of everything. I think we could talk about whatever. I mean, I think I got it. Let's see what the audience says. Dog man, dog man. Okay, now, to be fair, if we're going to be calling them dog men, I think it's perfectly fine to be calling skinwalkers skinwalkers. Because <laughs> I'm not happy with the term dog man, but neither. everyone it seems Amounts to be the same okay thing. with it. It's the same thing. Dang. Yeah. It's a term that's used to just describe it. That's become more recognizable now. Yeah, the end result is pretty much the same. Mm -hmm. I hate even though I have the flip top. Those things, these, the, the lids on these never stop. What is wrong with these people? Why can't they not make a lid that fits right on the bottle? Don't understand it. Walking wolves. I got stories of that, too. That's a little bit different than what we're, you know. I'll tell you what I'll do. I've been talking about this, and I've been saying I'm gonna, I'm, I was going to do it for the show we're going to record tonight. And it's about Petra. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's about the desert of Petra and what happened to this woman and when she went out there. We were going to do it last night, and then we were just tired, and my voice was going out, which it's doing right now. Of course, I had something. I don't know what. <clears throat> and then there's another one that I call the Costa Rican werewolf. Um, don't really know what else to call it. 
What's the difference between a walking wolf and a dog man? Michael, I will say this, and because we have some stories that are very specific that look just like wolves walking around on their hind legs. And it looks really unnatural and weird. And I don't, I have a bunch of those, actually. I mean, not a, not a bunch. What would you say, you guys? Maybe I mean, two, enough. two dozen? No. Yeah, quite a bit. Probably two dozen or so and off the top of my head. It's a pretty common, like, it's not the most common, but it's a pretty common one we got. Yeah. I mean, and, and it, 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 they typically just tend to be, I saw a wolf stand up on its hind legs, or it'll be walking on its hind legs, and it'll just go down on all fours, and that's pretty much it. But I can tell you there have been multiple encounters with these things. Uh, one of the stories that I was going to talk about when I had said, I don't know if I had told you that other story or not. But here, here's one. If you want to hear a dog man story, I guess I'll give you one. And this isn't the, this isn't the, uh, the Costa Rican werewolf one. This, that one's really good. That one was given to me by someone who was working down there as a contractor, and he's, he's Mexican. He speaks good Spanish, and his parents were originally from Mexico City, which he's not one of these people that's coming up illegally. No, he came here because his mother was a translator. And so he, you know, which is really weird how they'll make them jump through hoops to come here. The smart, educated ones that we could use to be here. Yeah, let's let, let's let's make them jump through every hoop in the book. But the the other people who are just going to come here and raise hell and cause problems, um, yeah, let's let, let's just pour them in. But whatever, they do that with. That's I'm telling you, folks. This is by design. So, anyways, he told me he says, you know, I got a job working as a contractor. I went down to Costa Rica and I had a really crazy thing happen. Um, and so he messaged me recently and he says, I'm going to give you my story. He's like my brother you know, found you years ago. He's been listening to you for a long time. He's like, and I don't, I don't listen to the show. And I was like, I'm not offended. I'm not offended. I totally, I, I get it. He said, I'm somewhat into Bigfoot, but he goes, but I don't believe it's an ape or whatever. And I said, well, I don't either. I think that's there. I think that's, that's one thing, but I think there's more than one thing going on. And there's all kinds of different people who say different things. I don't know. I don't profess to be the expert of any of this, okay? So you say that I say that you're lying because I've never said I'm an expert in any of this stuff. But th there was a story, and I may have already told this one. So that one, the Costa Rican werewolf, I'm going to get into that one eventually. But today what I'll tell you right now, and if we have time, I'll get into the other one. There was a guy that I met downtown in the bar, and he was from Canada. And his dad was French Canadian, and his mother was Lebanese. She was they, she was from a Marianite family, and I met his parents. And his dad, I gotta say, was some kind of hill giant. I'm not joking. I'm six three at that time. I actually have a compressor right by my back. It's not important, but whatever. I lost a little bit of my height. But I'm almost six four, so this guy, he's he was he towered over me. He was like six nine. Dang. This guy was huge. And oh. his hands He's a Nephilim. Oh, his his arms and his he was huge. Big long legs, big, big guy. When he laughed, the whole bar could hear it. And he was a very nice guy. He was probably twenty years my senior. And uh, his mother, very striking, beautiful woman. A lot of the Lebanese people are very good looking. They're Phoenicians, right? Which is like Levantian mixed with Greek. This is that's what it is. To be honest. And so, they come into the bar, and y'all met uh, my friend who runs the bar down in, in uh, the beach. Where, mm -hmm. uh -huh. So anyway, these are this is his family, and he's like, yeah, I'm gonna introduce you to, to Ishmael, and I'm, hey, what's going on? We became friends. And of course, R. Ash, who's in my book about his dog man encounter, he he was we became friends with him. He was a good dude. He was our age, and they were down for a couple of weeks. His dad looked like Paul Bunyan. He's like reddish, blonde hair, and just a giant man. When I shook his hand, he could put my whole hand. Well, that's, I don't have big hands for a big guy. I really don't. But he had these humongous hands and my hand would fit inside of it. And I'm like a little kid with my hand, <laughs> you know, and I'm a big dude. And um, so this guy, he, but he was a really nice guy. He was like a gentle giant, dude, whatever. 
And uh, so one night we all went out and we had a few drinks and we went to one of our favorite places. And we started talking about all, and like I said, if I've told the story before, I apologize, but I just remembered this one when I was looking at my computer earlier. And, uh, yeah, right around the time I was looking at the prices of the cameras and thinking, oh, that camera's only $119. <laughs> I'm over there, like, trying to debate about buying this camera. Like, oh, that, that's not a bad price. You know, then I put my glasses, I'm like, oh, oh, there's another one right there. Ooh, I didn't see <laughs> that. They all kind of just blended together. The zeros and the ones. I'm sorry, you know. Um, then I had to back up. I'm like, hold up, hold them up, you know. Um, but so I, I was looking through the stories, and I was like, you know, the dog man stuff. <clears throat> and since we're going to do the Petra episode, like, coming up on Tuesday, I thought, why not we do one from the Levant? Well, this one didn't happen in the Levant, but it happened to people from there originally, anyway. His mother was from there, and her first cousin was my boss at that time. And y'all met him. He works for the transit system now. He's a good guy. Mm -hmm. Really good guy. Yeah. I've known him for years. I've known him. I'm very well familiar with, with uh, a lot of the people from that community. And they religi religiously, they were called Drus. Now, people probably don't know what that is. The Drus are not Muslims, and they're not Christians, and they're not Jews. They're like something in between, mixed with reincarnation, elements of reincarnation. Uh, it is a very small enclave of them, and they're typically Lebanese, but there's a little bit of them from Syria, which are the, really the same people. Syrian, though, if the further east you go, it starts to have a little bit of a Persian flair because they're right there. And it's, you know, there's Iraq and Syria and it's all right there together. So what ended up happening, he tells us this story. His dad was a really cool guy. His dad says, you know, we got stories of werewolves up in Canada. He's like, there was a cabin that we went and vacationed at near Ottawa. And his dad's this humongous guy. He's like at the table, just taking out. He's like the mountain, you know. Yeah. And I'm like, I like the guy. He's really cool, man. And uh, he's like, so I could tell you, we should work with a guy. He was a trapper. And this guy, he spoke fluent French too. And he said, he's a French Canadian. Swarping down, this bear-like creature chased him up a tree, and he thought, well, this thing's just gonna climb right up the tree, and it didn't. Because this thing was so huge, it couldn't climb that tree. It just started trying to push it down. And he said, and luckily, two or three of his buddies came and they intervened, shooting at this thing. He's like, and he never did know whether or not it was, you know, some sort of deformed bear or a bear man type creature, whatever. Um, so I thought that was interesting. But then he tells me, he says, talk to my son. He's got a story for you. He goes, now I was there, but nothing happened to me. So, I, and like I said before, if I've told you this story before, I apologize, but it's something I had, you know, hadn't visited in a long time. And a couple of weeks ago, I was talking to my brother and he was like, you should tell that story about his encounter. I didn't remember it. Probably because when I recorded it and put it in my computer, once again, I was in my 20s and I was drunk. <laughs> okay. Thank you for that donation, Brooke, Brooke uh, Fuseler, that will go into our camera fund, which at this point looks like it's going to take a long time to get that done because apparently they're super expensive, you know. So my hat's off to people who have these and invest in them. They probably treat them like their children. You probably have to. Yeah. You want them to break and fall apart or whatever. Um, if somebody said something to me, and I'm not going to veer off on another t tangent or anything like that, but but somebody said something to me a couple days ago, and they said, you need to be more professional. People don't like it when you talk about other things, about yourself and about your life and how you met these people. Just tell the stories and that's it. Don't do anything else. Is that what you want? Because if it is what you want, then I can figure something else out. But I thought people would like to be a little more engaged. That's how I do things. I wasn't rude back to this. I thought this person was very rude. I wasn't rude back to, well, I don't know if it was him or her, but they didn't give me any, but it, that, that this individual, 
I didn't argue or anything. I just said, thank you for your whatever. And they're like, no problem, you know. Whatever. Yeah, people are rude a lot. It's really a rude a lot. You can't get offended by that. You just got to go on. It's just when we get attacked, personal attack, that's when you get upset. Um, but no, okay, because I don't know. Maybe sometimes it's, you know, I need to change it up or something. I don't know. God, this chair is just a... So what ends up happening, I talked to his his son. We go out drinking one night. And it was like a weeknight or something early in the week because, you know, I had to work at the bar on the weekends. And I, I said, hey, let's go out to this place that we like to go to. And it was industry bar, basically. For people who worked in, in the industry, Sunday, Monday was kind of an off day. So you, if you work downtown, Austin, those are the days you would go out. And I think this was like a Monday or something because some of the places were still jumping on – Sunday. So there was this one place. Thank you, Sugar Britches, for that donation. Where have you been, Sugar Britches? You know, you shouldn't be donating money to us. We should be donating money to you. Um, so th this bar that we'd go to was hopping. I mean, it was like you go in there and it was, I mean, you were outside of the place. You would not know that there was this humongous party going on. You open the door and you're like, whoa, and it was just boom, you know. So we go in there, and, and we knew the bartenders, we knew the staff, we knew everybody. We knew the, the door guy, everybody just, you know. So we went up to this little, like, there was these little steps up to this like, kind of little loft area, and it was quieter up there, and the music wasn't so loud. And you could even pull this. There was a curtain, and we could pull, and we could sit and talk. And for, for a few years, that became, like, our spot, just hang out, go up there and be able to talk and not have to deal with all the blah, 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 the, the rabble. Miguel, thank you for that donation. He says, here's my end of the week cult fee payment. I love you guys. <laughs> See, you could be a cult member like Miguel and donate to the whatever fund. PRT camera The fund. PRT, yeah, camera fund. Kool-Aid so, fund. The, Kool the Kool-Aid with the other guy. Had the the Kool-Aid with the other friend. <laughs> so, so, what, so what ended up happening? We're sitting there, and I remember this, you know, after I read it again, after I put, because this was sitting in my computer for a long time, but and I may have told this one. So if I did, once again, I apologize because I can't remember if I did or not. Thank you for that donation, T. Cutler. This, what he told me, and, and like those of you may have already heard this, was really, really crazy story. Him and his little cousin, and I can't remember her name, but she was, she was there at, at drinking with us, and she said, He's talking about the thing that happened up in Canada at the lake house. Because I said, your dad said you had a story. They kind of looked at us kind of suspiciously. Well, me and Arash both have had encounters with weird stuff. So my brother, we all did. So we all kind of, you know, lightened the mood. Said, look, we're not here to make fun of you. Your dad gave me a story about a bear that attacked a guy. And he goes, oh, yeah. He's like, that whole area is weird. He's like, when we were kids, he's like, you know, my mother, she's from Lebanon, you know, and she gave us all these weird stories of the jinn. Because, you know, it's an Arabic, Levantian thing. It's not, it's not Islamic. The is Islam, uh, they adopted that from the Arab culture, from the, you know, the, 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 the Semitic people. It's not the other way around. So what ended up happening, he said, my mother, uh, she, she's from, you know, Lebanon, and so she raised us on all these weird stories, and one of them was this creature that we call, he goes, we call it, you know, a wolf man. Like it's half wolf, half human, whatever. Tripping up on you, says, I will try this again and pray this time. Love you guys and PRT family. Thank you for that donation. I don't know what happened last week. Did you ever figure that out? It never showed anything on our end. I mean, I, I I tried to find it, but there's nothing there. Mm, that's weird. I wonder what that was. Anyways, so he said, my mother told us all these stories. He goes, and, and she told us a story of this weird ball of light that chased her home one time. She gets into her yard and she's running up in, in, in her village and she's running up into the, the yard and what looked like 
legs were coming out of the ball of light and were moving. <laughs> like something was coming, coming out, out of, of it. it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that was a, a freaky story. But then he went on to tell me, he says, when I was a kid, he's like, I think I was like eight or nine. He's like, and my little cousin here, she was like, he, she's like, I was six. She remembered. <laughs> When no eight or nine. She's like, I was six. It was the summer. She's like, and you were nine. And he goes, okay. And she says, tell him what happened. He says, we, we had this tennis ball and we would throw it against the wall and then we would, we would hit it. It was like a handball game. And there were three of us playing. And he said that we, we heard this like twig snap, brush moving, whatever. And he said, we look and we see this creature. I don't know what it was. He's like, it just, you couldn't, it was like, it was purposely standing and he kind of did this with his hand. He said it was pur purposely standing with some like tree leaves or whatever in front of it, blocking its face. And he said, we were so freaked out. We were like, what is this? And you know, what is that? And we could see the legs. He goes, the legs look like a wolf's legs. He's like, and then we just kind of lost track of the ball and where it went. And so he said that this thing, the ball rolled. We don't know where it went. We were busy just staring at this creature. He's like, and then we kind of all kind of turned and looked and we were, you know, walking kind of toward it. He goes, and then I realized, oh, we're all kind of moving toward this thing to see what it is. And he's thinking, I thought maybe it was a trick. He's like, and then we hear this, like somebody clearing their throat, like a man. He's like, and we turn around and we look. He's like, and right there in the, in the clearing, there was a tree. There were some trees cleared out where there was like a yard for this cabin. And he said, this was not no isolated cabin in the middle of nowhere. He said, no, no, no. He said, like every 50 to 60 yards, there was another cabin. Like there was like, they were spread out, yeah. you know. And he said that, you know, the, the, they weren't crammed together. You were, you had your own little space or whatever, but you, they were, this was a, a fan, like a family get together, you know? And he said that we were sitting there and he goes, and we were observing what looked like a werewolf and it had its arms on its legs and it was holding the ball like this. He said it was kind of slender, but with really broad shoulders. And these long, weird-looking legs. He's like, and while we were looking at this one, we look to our right and we see the other thing that was hiding behind the tree. And it's walking toward this other one. He said, my one little cousin, she immediately ran. And they both kind of stood up and, like, stepped toward us. Because running, not a good idea. He's like, she ran up... She, around the corner, up the house, up the stairs. He said there were these stairs going up into the, the porch. And he said, and you and I, he was talking to his, his cousin, and she, they, they were there. He said, you and I, we stayed there. And he's like, we were terrified. We didn't move. He goes, we didn't do anything. We didn't, we didn't even make a move, not a, you know. And the thing takes the ball and throws it over his shoulder. He's like, it's very much like a man. He's like, and then it put its hands out like this, like a weird, like a weird thing. And the other one, he's like, was standing with its arms crossed, just staring at us. And so eventually we hear one of our aunts calling our name and we, we're like kind of turning our heads. He goes, at least I am turning my head. The other person involved in the story, his cousin, she was like, I didn't move. Her name was, I think, Marina. Marana, Marana, Marina, something like that. Marana didn't move. She was like, I stood there, frozen. And I was reading this encounter, you know, that I had put into the computer, and I was remembering this, and I was like, and if I've told this before, like I said, I apologize. Um... There's a lot of encounters, and they sometimes, and I'm not going to say that some people's are more thrilling than others, but sometimes they kind of run together. Yeah. You know, if you get enough of them, you read enough of them. I mean, I read 30 a day, you know, not not 30 a day, but 
I will probably what, 10, 15, you know. This weird encounter, right? They turn and they walk into the woods. And one of them looks over his shoulder and just kind of like, and they looked at each other and they, they were walking. He said, and then we ran. We were in the house and we were screaming and crying and freaking out. And the adults were like, come on, stop being, you know, whatever. Let's, you know, whatever. He said, we had this one uncle who was just didn't have kids, wasn't a nice guy, had no patience for children. And he goes, he would spank you with the drop of a hat. And the other parents were always getting on to him and getting, you know, aggravated with him and, um, and telling him, stop spanking the kids. You know what I mean? Like, it's a different culture. I've been around this culture. And it's it's kind of like the Hispanic culture in some ways where the aunts and uncles have the ability to spank you without Karen getting mad. They just said, oh, well, my kid must have been acting bad. You know, <laughs> you know they say, you know, yeah. go play outside. Get out of go. Andre, afuera, get out of here. We don't want to be around yeah, your you. Parents drop drop you off at your aunt or uncle. Yeah. You basically belong to them for that. You belong time. to them for that day, and they can beat you and abuse you and kick you into the street like a soccer ball, or put you up in a tree like it did. My sister wouldn't stop talking back. So, <laughs> one of the only funny things, and one of my great aunt and uncles, I couldn't stand they were evil, but they put her up in a tree and put, <laughs> she, she stopped. Uh -huh. I mean, that was the only time I ever thought, hey, this is actually pretty funny because me and your mom were laughing about it. We were like, oh. I should shut up and keep talking back because we want to eat lunch and you won't shut up. Uh, but no, this this is, um, you know, it's, it's it's how they are. It's their culture. You know, as you said, my uncle always spanking us. And he's like, don't be talking about that. Yeah, I'm just trying to ruin the trip. <laughs> Badass little kids. So he's like, whatever. He's like, that night. We were sitting there, we heard something bumping against the house, and we were all like, we knew it was this monster. He's like, and my dad, being from French descent, you know, Canadian, whatever, he called it the Rougarou. It's a name that the French use. And he says, you guys saw the Rougarou, huh? He's like, he didn't bring it up again, he just thought it was funny. He's like, but us, we weren't laughing. And so that night was very restless sleep. The next day, we just tried to put it out of our heads. They told us that it was a figment of our imagination, and we had to go along with it, which happens a lot. And he's like, then we end up going down to the lake and swimming and coming back after like five, six hours, sunburned. This chair is just driving me nuts. And so he said, we go back upstairs up the stairs to the to the, the cabin. He goes, and I see something move in the corner of my eye. And then the trees move. And he said that one of the neighbors who they owned the cabin there, you know, this cabin in particular belonged to his aunt and uncle, but he said that the neighbors, that they had a cabin there, they were visiting from another part of Canada. And he said, he told them, he said, <clears throat> There's a lot of Bigfoot in this wood, in these woods, Sasquatch. They believe in them. He's like, he goes, I've seen one. It looks like a big, giant, barrel-chested ape type thing, whatever. And he heard him talking, and he goes, my one little cousin, she goes downstairs. She's like, that's not what we saw. We didn't see a Bigfoot. And he's like, well... That's the only unexplained thing I know of in these woods. And he goes, I'm a believer. I saw one years ago. And he, it was like, he said when he told him, he said it was like 20 years before that. He had seen one one time. So they're not like just seeing them all the time, you know. And, you know, he said, you know, he goes, there are bears that people see on occasion up here. Maybe it was a bear. Once the cousin said what they saw was not interested in believing that there could be a wolf-like creature on its back legs, especially two of them. So that night, <clears throat> they're playing a board game. And the parents were in there drinking and having a good time and yelling and telling stories from their childhood. And while they're, 
you know, regaling each other with tales of the past. He's like, we're in there playing shoots and ladders or some crap. He goes, I don't remember what it was. He's like, and then we hear something hit the back of the cabin. There's a bunch of us kids there. There's like six, seven of us. And there was a bunch of littler ones running around, being loud. <laughs> My uncle was spanking kids left and right. <laughs> so they're like, just, stop it. So what is this that's damn wolf boy? What does this mean? What is this guy? Hope you're not a troll because you won't last long if you're going to be a troll. I've never seen you before in here. Be polite. You can stay. Talk stuff. It's probably something out of context. You know, you won't be here very long. So what ended up happening, they go up to the window. Well, one of the older cousins goes up to the window. There were two brothers. He goes, and they were about a year in age. They go up to the window. Open the window. Open it. And everybody else is like, don't do it, don't do it, you know. And one of them is really brave. He's like 12 years old. The other one's like 13. Okay. So they're like way older than the other kids. And, you know, there's a big difference between a 13-year-old and a 9-year-old. So anyways, I say, so leave, leave Donut alone until we figure out. Okay, don't, don't do anything. Maybe he's just, you know, whatever. That's in the chat, folks. So anyways, what ends up happening? This kid gets real brave. He sticks his head out the window and he looks and he goes, there's nothing. And as soon as he says that, they see this big paw-like hand thing go over the back of this kid's shirt and pull him. Out of the window. He's like, and everybody's like, oh, oh, you know. He's like, I'm not going to lie. He's my cousin. Didn't really like him. <laughs> you know, this kid was very honest. He was just like, I, you know, he's, I, I didn't like him. I didn't like him. His I mean, cousin, it, it, he didn't like him. It's terrible, but I'm not going to lie. It, it is kind of a funny mental image. It is it's funny. Like, it was funny when I was... <laughs> And when they told the story and when I was rereading it, I was, you know, reliving what he had told me. And then at that point, I don't remember a whole lot because we just kept drinking. And, then, you know, you kind of go like, well, you know. But this thing. And so what I read was that it basically the kid was outside screaming at the top of his lungs and nobody heard him because the parents were in there drinking and having a good time. And playing some kind of game with quarters where they, you know, were, were, it was like some kind of game they were playing. It wasn't quarters where you flip it into the thing, whatever, but he was trying to explain it to me. I don't know. It was some kind of Arabic game they play. Um, and there's a bunch of different ones, so I can't tell you which one it was, okay? But he said they were playing some game. Nobody's paying attention, and this kid's screaming, and there's music playing. And there's like 20, 30 people in this house, you know, and they're all jumping around. And it's only a five-bedroom place. And there's like 30 people jumping around. And he said that all the kids ran out of the room just screaming, oh, my gosh. And he got pulled out. His brother was a little too close, and the, the arm came in to grab him. When they go outside, the adults come pouring out on both sides just to, to find where this kid went. Really weird. I think his name was like Jeremiah or something. They were Christian Marianites, whatever. But anyway, they go around the back. And he's gone. So everybody goes pouring into the woods looking for this kid, blah, 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 you know, you know, just screaming, yelling, it's your fault, his fault, blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> the kids are told to stay in the living room under the watchful eye of two adults. They come back. They said, we got to call the Mounties. We can't. This, this kid is gone. He's been abducted or taken, whatever. 
They call the police. Ten minutes later, after or ten minutes after the police showed up, which was a good half hour, it took a while. Everybody, the mom and dad were crying. People were still wandering around in the woods. This kid just comes walking out of the woods and goes right up to the to the, to the people and the police. Everybody's standing there and they're like, "Whoa, there's the kid." And this kid basically told them he didn't remember a thing. <laughs> the last thing he remembered was just standing by the window. Maybe he's lucky that he doesn't remember. He had scratches all over him, but they had determined that it was real little light scratches from like maybe being drugged through the woods. And maybe all these people running out after them, you know, made it drop him and let him go or decided to not eat him or whatever it was going to do to him. So I reached out to this guy. Hadn't talked to him in years. Actually, I, I did, did reach out to him um, apparently a few years ago. And he had messaged me back. But as of right now and today, let me check again. This isn't the guy that got grabbed. Okay. So I just got a message from the guy who had the reptilian encounter. That's interesting. He's willing to come on and talk as long as he can be anonymous. Cool. So maybe we'll set that up. Maybe we could set that up for... Maybe we can do a pre-record with them. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah. So what ends up happening? Kid don't remember anything. The whole family was just like, okay, you know. But it's something that happened. And Ishmael remembers this happening Mirana I think that's how you say her name Mirana she remembers it happening and they told us this story and I will say at the time I remember hearing it I believed it but like I said I couldn't remember the ending or whatever all that happened I had to go back and find it because well I got drunk sorry so what happens when you go into these places, drinking, gambling, whatever it is you do, just remember, not many good things happen. <laughs> I could be, I can attest to that. So I asked him, I said, years later, you know, because at the time he was telling us, he was like, he was 23, and this happened when he was nine. I said, did your cousin, did, you, did he have any weird effects or that? And I said, yeah, he was weird. He was very weird. And here's what's even weirder. He moved overseas, back, and he, like he went to Lebanon. He was born over in Canada. He was never a Lebanese. He wasn't a citizen of you know nothing. His parents were, and he decided to move. Now th this is what's weird. His mother, his mother was Drus, and she had married this Maronite Christian, which is not really. The Druze are a very closed community. They really don't do that. Yeah. But a few people in this family had married outside of, and the two sisters were the ones that did that. One of them even married a French-Canadian Catholic. But this guy, he turns 18. The day he turns 18, he became a total loner. Never talked to anybody, hardly ever, would never just, family get together, she would just sit there and look. And we actually have a cousin like that. Just a skinny kid that sits there and stares at everybody. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, Anthony? Yeah. He just stares at people. Doesn't talk. You can try to engage him, but he ain't going to say much. Um, he's an odd duck. This person, he said, this is what he does. He just sits there and he stares. He never talks. And then we'd get together. We'd have... Easter, whatever, you know, different holidays, family get-togethers, and he wouldn't talk. He wouldn't do anything. 
Then he decides he's going to adopt his mother's religion and move back to Lebanon, which we're going move back. You've only been there one time. And no, Drus is D R U Z E, I believe. Make, double check, make sure I'm correct on that. I believe that's right. Yeah, it is. I'll, I'll put it D-R-U-Z-E. in D R U Z E. Mm hmm. They are the only, like, there is an Israeli general who's Drus. He's a Drus. Um, and I believe he's, uh, I want to say Jordanian or maybe Palestinian, but he's actually an Israeli general. And he's the highest ranking of, of, of any of the Drus have ever gotten in that military. And it's weird because they don't participate in, like, there was a civil war, you know, and they got messed with by the, by the Christians, by the Muslims, and the Jewish people. They got attacked by everybody. Tried to wipe them out. Everybody did. It's what happens. It's like the Kurds, you know, when they get attacked by Iran, by by. Syria, by Turkey, they get messed with by Iraq, and everybody was killing them and trying to wipe them out. But anyway, it's it's crazy what happened. He moves away, and he goes overseas, and he starts to follow the Druze religion, which he was not raised in, but he did study it and learn it and decided to go back to his roots, I guess. The last time I talked to this guy, which was a few years ago, because I just saw on there like Dogman and you know whatever, and it was when I was first starting the show, so I wanted to wait, and I still I'm still doing that now to this day with a lot of people. There's a lot of people whose stories I would like them to tell or to give me more information on. So you have to shelve it, and you have to just let it sit until it's time. I'm doing that with two books right now. It's very frustrating. Hopefully, that those, those things will happen. Maybe not. So what ended up happening, I'm listening to this conversation going on, and it may be something I have to deal with. Okay, so anyways, I hear my wife's voice. I don't know what's going on. So anyways, what happens is, I get in touch with this guy, and I said, hey, I'd like you to give me the rest of the details of this story. If you could tell me again the story. He says, yes, I will. And then we never talked again. So then I re-messaged him early today, early. Still no response. Wait. No. Well, and, and if he gives me more details or there's anything I need to update you on, I will. But that's the story. But this guy, his cousin, get this. He moves to Lebanon he lives in a Druze village with people who don't really know him, and he's sort of an outsider. Eventually, he moves to right outside of a place called Baalbek. Now, the reason that's significant is because Baalbek was once a Canaanite stronghold. And that place was built for the intent and the worship, for the intentional worship, that it was built there intentionally, let's put it that way, to worship this god, little g, whatever you want to call it, called Baal, or Baal. Interestingly enough, in the creation stories of the Gnostics, Yal the Baal is actually the god of this world, and he's not a good guy. You know, I'm not going to get into a whole thing about religion or whatever because everybody's got their own beliefs. I'm not even going to give you what I think about all that. That's just what it is. We'll leave it with that. We're not going to go into it and talk about that. That's not for this show. That's for another type of show right now. We're not doing that. But odd that he would move there. And when questioned by his mother, 
according to Ishmael. Yes, Baal is evil, that's right. But uh, he said he felt compelled to live there. Strange, too, that he had this weird fascination with wolves. So, the strange, weird, weird coincidences, maybe, I don't know. Tell me what you think, folks, in the comments section. Yeah, I mean, this his his whole the whole thing is weird, and then his predilection toward wolves and being abducted by two whatever they were. Somebody said soul transfer. I have no idea. P. Gene sixty three. Yes, and we're going to talk about that at some point. We may do the Costa Rican werewolf, and we may do the Petra episode. I don't know. The reason the Petra episode is interesting is because it involves wolves. It involves what I believe are the jinn. I don't like talking about it too much, but it is what it is. I've been kind of holding back on that one because I know that it's probably going to give me some sort of weird nightmares. Yeah, I'm not joking. So I wake up today, I had a nightmare. Middle of the day, I, I went to sleep really late, like 10, 11 in the morning. I was, I was up all day doing paperwork, trying to get some stuff ready for a proposal for tomorrow because some people owe us a bunch of money and they're going to use everything they have to say, well, your guard didn't pick up a piece of cardboard this big and then one of them's tooth is kind of crooked and I don't know if we should pay you. I don't care that we owe you $22,000. So you got to get everything together, and then I had to do a proposal for another job, whatever. But luckily, I didn't have to talk to anybody on the phone about any of this crap. It was all about the show. And I woke up, and I had missed a call from a guy that I really needed to talk to, and I'm glad we did. The conversation started off contentious, but it ended up good. So... I'm going to make a public announcement about that tomorrow. <clears throat> yes, Baal was not a nice guy, and the Israelites did worship him at one time, too. Yes, that is correct. But that place now has become a part of the, of the lore of Lebanon, Baal, Baalbek. People have weird things that happen to them there, just like al Madam, and just like Petra and Jordan. And let me give you a little bit of understanding. So when we talk about Petra, al Madam, and Baalbek, and I have several stories of each, but each one has a couple that really stand out. Understand the Levant and the way that I explain it. There are several dialects that people speak there of the Arabic language. And there are also other languages like Farsi, the people that is not Arabic. To understand that, that they're not all the same people. And if you look at the map, it's all drawn like somebody was, was drunk and took a crayon and drew an arrow. Ah, the British partitioned it off once they wanted it after World War I. They won World War I, uh, taking it from the Ottoman Empire. The Ottomans were Germany and, of course, Hungary, Austria. That was their big ally in the World War I. They were absent from World War II because they were still reeling from World War I, having lost all their territory and their strongholds. They were instrumental, though, in World War I in keeping the Russians from being able to just tee off they had to be thinking about the Ottomans in the south. And, of course, World War I, the Germans completely smashed them. And then in World War II, in my opinion, the only reason that the Germans didn't smash them again, because they had them on the ropes, was huge, huge reinforcements from Allied supply lines. And Germany was fighting a two-front war. Not a good thing to do. 
and they were bogged down fighting in the West. The United States, of course, Canada, and don't don't say, oh, Canada didn't do much. They didn't have it. Yes, they did, too. They had an army, and they had the whole army over there with them. The Canadians, the Americans, the Australians, but they mostly fought in the Pacific Theater. But not completely. And then, of course, the British and the French army that was in exile for you know, whatever. So you were fighting all of them, and then you were fighting the Soviets on the other side. Yes, that will lead to problems. Not getting it done quick enough. I could go in the history of how, why, when, who, where, what, whatever, and I could tell you every bit of it. But we're not here for that either. What I am talking about is the Middle East. And the history would teach you a lot. And you'd be doing yourself a big favor, whether you're a Christian or you're Jewish or you're Muslim or you know Islamic, whatever, and whatever type of Christian, Maronite, Catholic, whatever, Orthodox, doesn't matter, Protestant, whether you're a Shiite or a Sunni Muslim, doesn't matter. Or if you're a Druze. And there's different types of Jewish. There's Orthodox. I mean, not, not all Jews are the same. Not all Christians are the same. Not all Muslims are the same. There's all types of different people. There's different types of Kurdish people. The Yazidi, for example. They're looked at as heretics by the other Kurdish. And it has been used as an excuse by the Iranians and various other countries to gas them, to bomb them, to kill them, because they worship the peacock god who is a shaitan. They know him as Lucifer. Is he the head bad guy? Or is it the other guy with the name with the A? There's two of them. I'm not even going to say the names. <clears throat> so you have all these different people and all these different tribes and all these different land, and they cut the map into some weird stuff. These people are not the same people. So what happens? You end up with basically intertribal warfare. The same thing happened in Africa and in Asia and in the Middle East which is part of Asia technically, but the Middle East, as we know it, encompasses Northern Africa, right? Saharan Africa, as we call it. Which is important to know because even though that's Africa, it's still part of what we consider to be the Middle East, that being Libya, Tunisia, all these different countries in, in Morocco, Algeria. And in these countries lies the past. And of course, Baal was present there too, in particular in Carthage, which would be modern day Tunisia. But the Tunisians, it wasn't just Tunisia. They had a little bit of these other countries there too, kind of, you know, they had an empire. The Carthaginians. And I argued with somebody the other day, and they said, no, Carthage, Carthaginians were Arab. I said, no, they weren't. Yeah, they were. That's the Arab people. I said, and they were Moors. Moors. Yes. Arabs. No. Two different things. You ever heard this? You can be this. Like all, let's put it this way, all Coke cans are, are soda. Right? But not all soda goes in Coke cans. That kind of thing, I don't know, you know, does it make sense? I don't know if I made a good analogy there. But I tried to explain in a group with a bunch of morons that um, <clears throat> <clears throat> there were very few Arabs there. There were Bedouin tribes of Arabs that were very sparsely populated, and it was mostly Berber. It's a different people. When the Arabs swept through on the road to conquest in the 600s, after Muhammad had his visions or whatever, that's when they established themselves and they set up colonies. And yes, the Arabs colonized that region. They also colonized Persia, whether the Persians want to admit it or not. They went from being Persian to pseudo-Persian because especially in the West, 
they ended up being under the under the under the heel of Islam. And the Zoroastrian religion was nearly destroyed, which was the predecessor of all of these other Abrahamic faiths. Whether they want to admit it or not, it's the truth. If you look at the Middle East, at the map, it's retarded the way they drew it. And excuse the, the, the saying, the retard word, whatever. I'm using it in a way that whoever drew it, it, they really have some sort of mental illness because they didn't take into account anything. Who lived there? What peoples were there? They just took a crayon and they drew it up and said, you know what, this looks fine. Hmm. Let them deal with it. But there's 15 different types of people living in that one country. Ah, but now they're called Jordanians. The end. Chip, chop, chip. That's what they did. So that led to a lot of problems, a lot of infighting, and then you had a ton of different dialects and a ton of different beliefs. Yeah, no one, that, that's, yeah, it means slow. But we, you know, when you say that or you say the word midget or anything like that, people get very upset and offended and they get, and I don't know where we went off the rails with all that to where now it's like you can't even say what something is. Some people get offended when you just call them, you know, whatever. You call somebody white or black, they get offended. Or if you say they're, they're whatever. They just, they, they read into it and take an offense to it. It's just what happens. But I'm not here to offend anybody. I'm here to tell you the history. So what happens with these Middle Eastern countries? The problem was that the maps were drawn all jacked up. And no one was giving the Arabs or any of the Semitic peoples at that time the voice to say, hey, this isn't correct. It was drawn up by a European power, the British, and they controlled it because they won World War I by the skin of their teeth. And they had the ability to do what they wanted. So what ended up happening? You have all these weird things going on, and someone who says, I'm Jordanian, that is not a race of people. They could be Berber. They could be a type of Arab. And there's different types of Arabs, and there's all these different religions. And you have Egypt, which is the most well-known of all the African countries, I would hazard to guess, probably... If you say Africa, the first thing you're going to say is Egypt, and it is Saharan Africa. And Egyptians aren't Arab either. Egyptians are Egyptian. But they do have Moorish blood in them, which is Bedouin, Arab, Berber, because they all became one under the, the, the guise of Islam. So that shows you right there, like how there's this big soup in the Middle East, and you don't really know what's going on, what's what. So you have to be careful. You have to be really careful because you know one dialect doesn't mean you know them all. Try talking to uh, an Iraqi interpreter. I've done it. Or an Afghani. There's different things going on there, too. People say ridiculous things like, oh, all them Arabs over there in Afghanistan. There is not a single Arab in Afghanistan. Nope. Pashtun, mostly. And they speak several different dialects. And in particular, there's two that are very strong there. So there you go. And I will shut up about the Middle East and history. And it is something that is very interesting to me because... The cradle of civilization is right there. And I'm not talking about the Abraham. People who are atheists or people who are very analytical will be like, no, it's not. Just because it's of the Abrahamic faiths. I didn't say anything about the Abrahamic faith. What I'm talking about is Samaria, which is Iraq. Very important. So... Part of what we do here at PRT is to try to teach you, and so you will be up when we talk about these deeper subjects, you'll know. You'll know. And every story is connected. 
But that doesn't mean we have to go off into that particular subject because if you go to school and you say you're in high school, you learn seven, eight different subjects every year. What do they got to do with each other? Everything has to do with everything. They're all connected. Geometry has to do with English and so on and so forth. Exactly. Christian Ar 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 Arredondo school won't teach none of these. No, they don't. Yeah, Abraham, when you when you look at Abraham, okay, for example, his name was Ibrahim, not Abraham. And Ibrahim, his last name was Wati, which is Ibrahim and Sarah Wati. That's who they were. They were Sumerians. They were not Hebrews, and they were not Israel. Israel hadn't been thought of yet. The Hebrews hadn't even been thought of. And that's the predecessors to the to the Israelites, which now is just a language. But the word Hebrew, does anybody know what the root is? It's Hebron. It was an Egyptian word. Do you know what the word meant? It meant outlaw, outsider, or troublemaker. Even later and later on, it became troublemaker, rabble rouser. Originally meaning immigrant. Because they came from Canaan to Egypt to work. And then there were more and there were more and there were more until the Egyptians said, this is a problem. We have too many of them and not enough of us. So they made rules and laws and basically enslaved them. And their economy began to depend on the Hebron. The Hebron were made up of, I, I believe, at least, tw I, I estimate at least 20 different, if not more, re religions, infinite number, but 20 different races that you could actually pinpoint to today. So you have basically every type of person in that region was going there and they were just being called hey, Hebron, Hebrew. So there's kind of this weird thing that's where they say, well, Abraham was the father, of, you know, yeah, yeah, I guess. But, you know, when you look at it going into Egypt and their captivity, and, and so I'll give you something right here. We'll do this. This is a story that I've been wanting to tell, and it's about the Middle East, too. And it is an Egyptian story. And in fact, I have a guy that works for me right now. He's on pose, working for us right now. He's an Egyptian. And um, I've known many of them in my life. And I had a neighbor who was one. And uh, I also knew one that she was Orthodox Christian. They're not all. Some of them are Coptic Christian. If you don't know what that is, look it up. I'm not going to get into that right now. But this person, she was an Orthodox Christian and introduced me to another guy who told me a really, really messed up story. His parents were from Egypt, not him, his parents. And they went to visit his grandmother in Cairo. His parents grew up outside of the port city of Alexandria, which we know was founded by Alexander the Great, the conqueror, the whatever. We talked about him yesterday at the end of the show. So here's, here's something. <clears throat> he says, when I was a kid... We went to go visit my grandmother who was living in Cairo. My grandmother was a retired doctor. She was a very educated person. But she was very superstitious. And she wore this necklace with an eye on it. And it's not the one you're thinking about. I know you're probably thinking of the one with the little eyelash things coming off of it looking like, you know. No. <clears throat> I'm talking about the ones that the Kurdish use, the Turkish use. The one that wards off the evil eye. Look it up. This one. Very odd. And you know, to this day, there are people in Egypt that believe that what the Westerners did when they opened up the mummy's tombs they opened up a curse upon the land because one of those mummies, and it's not talked about what much in the West, and, well, 
They had very specific things that were supposed to happen if they were ever disturbed. One of them was a 700-year curse. And we know that archaeologically, this tomb was probably looted even before the Western powers came. So who knows when, when it started. It could have been during Napoleon's time. We could be three or 400 years into the curse. We don't know. Maybe there's two or 300 years left. I don't know. But whoever disturbed that tomb, that was the truth. That was what they believed to be the truth. When the modern day people, which calling modern day 1800s, late 1800s, maybe you're talking about the modern era. When they began to meddle and mess around and open tombs and do things, well, these places had already been looted, more than likely. So like one of them, though, in particular, was a curse of 700 years. Egypt would never prosper Even weirder is the stories, and they believe these tr true to be true. Without the prosperity or whatever that they were lacking, that they would lose their identities. And in a sense, they have. They're not, the religion is predominantly Islam now. That's not their original religion. And... The people are completely cut off from their past. They're separated from their origin of who they once were, and they don't even look the same. And Zahi Hawask, or whatever his name is, can say whatever he wants. There's a lot of history that's lost there. So what ended up happening, he's like, I go there and I stay with my grandmother. And I had a lot of fun. He's like, I had fun. I had a lot of fun. My cousin was there and we had a great time. And we left. He goes, I couldn't wait to go back. He goes, when I got older, I was 16 years old. My parents put me on a plane to go visit her. She would always come to, to, to visit us. And he's like, but they put me on a plane to go visit her. He's like, and I go to visit my grandmother. And she says, I want to take you somewhere. So they drive out into the middle of the desert to an archaeological dig that was abandoned. He doesn't know why. And he doesn't even know exactly where it was at. He was like, it was out in the middle of nowhere. He goes, and we, we go and we move this wooden door, like that was just laid on top of this. But you wouldn't even notice it, you know, you see if you weren't paying attention. And then they walk down these stairs. And he says, and when we get down to the bottom of the stairs, there's a tomb. And it's not some grandiose tomb, whatever. He goes, it was just dusty, dirty, and it smelled like mildew. Yeah, no one. Egyptian religion still lives on in Thelema and Ordo Templi Orientis. Yeah, but that's, those are, that's not, those aren't, to me, that's not real. That's a, that's a made up trying to, Make you know, br build a bridge where there's not one. That's my opinion. I don't. I don't. I don't believe. I don't agree with that. That's mm. Crowley liked to do. Like to 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 pose and pretend and whatever you know. But anyway, so we're we're over here in the tomb, right? And he says, "Dude, there's nothing in it." He said, but his grandmother, she's like, he's like, dude, she always had money. A lot of it, a lot of money. So he says, what always happened is no matter what happened, if I went and he goes, when it was time for me to go to college, bam, my brother's time to go to college, bam. He said, I was your favorite grandkid, always giving me money, always taking care of me, always whatever, financially. And at one point in time, he goes, the country there, and this guy's my age, he said, the country there, was very, very poor. They were in the middle of a drought that was destitute. People were starving. He goes, and my grandmother was walking through the streets handing people money. 
And I thought, man, she's a she's a doctor, retired doctor, but she she's well off. She's like takes off the necklace, puts it into the tomb, and then he sits, he sees another one. The only thing that's not covered in sand and all nasty in there. And she pulls up another necklace and she puts it on her neck. She says, I change these out every 30 days. This tomb charges this necklace. She's like, it wards off evil, in particular poverty. This is a weird story. And he's like, whoa. And she tells him, she's like, I'm going to have them make you one. You take a bag with you. And then they leave. They drive back into town. He estimated it was about 20 miles out there. He goes back home to the States with one of these necklaces that had gotten made by who to know who, he doesn't know who. He gets home. And what ends up happening? His dad is like, oh, I see that she's giving you her magic, whatever. His mother, she is not, does not like him insulting. That's, that's her mother. That's, that, yeah, that's his grandmother on his maternal grandmother. He's like, she's like, don't be insulting. He's like, yeah, well, she practices magic. And he, she says, no, it's not magic. It's the power of our land. See, what people don't understand, what they don't know, is no matter what religion comes rolling through a particular region, whether it's Egypt or Rome or whatever, there will always be people who hold fast to the old ways. There are people in the Norse, and I don't mean the North, I mean the Norse, like the Swedish, the Danish, part of Finland, not all of Finland, and Norway, and Iceland, and they still practice the old ways. They still believe in all that. Yes, Love Cat, say a prayer for Love Cat's mother. She's been in the hospital. And that's what this was. She was practicing something so ancient that it goes back to the time of the pharaohs. Something that the Romans, when they had control and the capital was Alexandria, which is where Cleopatra was, she was in Cairo. People were like, oh, it was Cairo. No, it wasn't. And sadly, the next generation up doesn't even know where the hell Cairo is. Probably thinks that Cairo is a planet or a moon of Pluto because that's, that's, that's where they're at up there and they're, I don't know. They think that Alaska is a tropical country. The dumbest people that have ever walked this earth next to the cavemen. And they're coming up to take over. Sad. <laughs> Cairo is a new club downtown, probably. Right? So this ancient practice was actually, the Romans tried to stamp it out when they took over Egypt. When they took it from the Macedonians, which would have been the Ptolemies, it became a vassal state of Rome. The Ptolemies still held sway and the Romans told them, keep things the way they are. You stay in charge. We don't want to upset the apple cart. You just supply us with grain and tribute, and we'll let you live. The Romans were brutal. They didn't play around. They defeated Carthage, which was their rival, utterly destroying and defeating them in a major battle at the plains of Zama, which was like the, the ultimate... Defeat, when Hannibal lost. And what goes on afterwards is a cleansing of everything Carthaginian, all their holdings, everything. 
So they utterly and totally destroyed them and even salted the earth to the point to where now it's even argued exactly where the capital was. Some people say it's here. Some people say it's there. Which city was the exact capital or were they all just, I don't know. So he finds out that his, that his grandmother actually practices an occult worship of an entity. Named Set. Or Sekhmet, who is the bad guy. He's the bad guy in the story. And he said it was odd to hear that my, my, my grandmother had believed in this goddess, this being that was completely about war and bloodshed and whatever. But if you gave it what it wanted, it would give you what you wanted. And what his grandmother wanted was money. Then he finds out that his grandmother had many patients that had died under her care. Really weird, really freaky. What's even worse is he finds out that when she would come to the United States, it wasn't to visit them. It was to hang out with her home dogs here from the temple of Set. See, these people resisted every advance of every other religion, whether it was Abrahamic or not. They believed in the old ways. And they trace the roots of this back to the time of before the Hebrons arrived. But it was an offset of the, of the Hebron who actually revived it because they wanted to be free from the bonds of the Egyptians, who at that time weren't serving these, those same older gods. I believe it was Ra. I could be wrong about that, but I believe that's what it was. It was the cult of Ra, which was, it, it depended on which, you know, emperor of the dynasty was in charge. And so his grandmother told him, this is how you make money. He said, for years I wore this amulet and I never had a money problem in my life until I lost it one day. Then his grandmother died. But she came to him in a dream. And in the dream, she was being held by her ankles and her arms. By black claws, like talons, holding her in place. She couldn't move, she couldn't talk, she couldn't do anything. She was bound and gagged. In the dream, he walked over and he pulled this cloth from her mouth and all this dust came out of it. This is a dream, right? And she told him this. She said, repent. And she was gone. Pew. She turned to sand. To this day, he doesn't know whether or not she was a dream or if that was really his grandmother. And he went on to ask me what I thought, and I told him it could be anything. I don't know. I saw my grandmother in a dream. She wasn't like that. But she wasn't worshiping a demon either. Or what I consider to be a demon. Gives me the chills. I'm here in the studio by myself. Pray for Anthony and Nelly, please, because he had to go pick her up. Um, I don't know exactly what's going on, but. So. This cult is very active here in the United States, and that's all I'm going to say about it. I'm not going to say anything else. Hmm. So I asked him, I said, when you were wearing this particular eye, I said, I will say this. I said, that was not what was giving your mother 
her power. That was symbolic. I said, because that eye would have been what wards off set. So that doesn't make sense. But recharging it in a tomb with a possible being who once was a vessel for the gods of Egypt, possibly, yes, there could have been power there, so much residual power that it was uh, very powerful. He said when he walked down into the tomb, he goes, it made his skin crawl, and he felt like something was touching him. He always thought it was spiders or something there. He wouldn't see it, but he felt it. And then years later, he had, his grandmother told him, she said, oh, that tomb was not anybody really important. She's like, that goes back a long ways, but it's very unstable and it could collapse. She's like, the main tomb was a nobleman that was way back down in there. But she said that that particular, that front tomb was where a lot of power was because that was the bodyguard, the head guy, the protector. So they put a lot of power into that first entry room. They put a lot of magic into it. So that when you walked in, there it is, right? To keep you from going deeper in and finding the real treasures. Some say to keep you from opening up the curse. When we were talking... He was shocked at how much I knew about all this. And I told him, I said, dude, I've been studying this stuff for a long time. I know probably more about this than most Americanized Egyptians or even the Egyptians that live over there because most of them just know the Islam. They don't know anything about their history. They don't know anything about their past. They don't even know where they're at or where they're going. And that is most people in most countries right now, sadly. This cult that we're talking about was so bad that multiple Roman emperors tried to stamp it out. Most notably, Augustus, who was the grand, the great nephew of, of Julius Caesar, who fought Mark Antony and Cleopatra over the control of the Egyptian grain supply and defeated them. Unfortunately, during that whole debacle, when Julius Caesar was there and he was fighting the, the Egyptian revolt to protect the Ptolemaic uh, dynasty, the burned Library of Alexandria, big tragedy. We don't know. We'll never know what, what all we lost. Our history, a lot of it just gone. Sand. Dust. Smoke. Shadows. But evil never really goes away. It never really dies. It always finds a way to come back around. So no matter what you do, you'll, it'll always be there. Like if you read Lord of the Rings, which is some of the only fiction I like. I don't read a lot of fiction. But it talks about at the end, Sauron was defeated. Once and for all. But... Still in the vicinity of Mordor, he would be seen by passers-by, skulking in the shadows. Still there, maybe just waiting. Tolkien kind of leaves us hanging like, hey, maybe he could come back. You never know. He's biding his time. It, he, he played the long game. He had thousands of years of immortal life. And he was known as a wise being that other beings would go to to learn things. He taught people about all kinds of different things and pretended to be good. His predecessor, really bad, evil guy, got thrown into the abyss or whatever it's called. And he was just like, oh, you know what? I'm not with that guy. Sorry, I know. Melkor, whatever his name is. I don't know if somebody knows his name. You could say. 
Yeah, somebody said the Eye of Horus. The, no, that's not what this was. Now, he showed me what it was, and it was the evil eye. It was the warding off of the evil eye. Somebody somewhere sold that, probably in a market. The item didn't matter. You could take this. It was putting it in that tomb and absorbing that power, that cosmic energy, that power from that eternal bodyguard of that mummy. And I'm telling you right now, that's what that was. There is a residual energy when things are knocked down. If you were to take out an evil spirit, boom, boom. And the spirit itself is gone. There is a residual energy that's left behind that you could feel. Yes, Valerie. The item was charged. You can feel it. You can feel the evil coming off of these things. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? This religion was nearly stamped out under three different pharaohs, right? And at least four different, four, I believe four different Romans, Julius and Augustus, of course, but also Valentinian, I believe, tried to do it, or Valer it might have been Valerian, and Trajan. They tried to stamp out that because what they did was spread throughout the Middle East. And you know what they like to do? They attacked children. They took children. In fact, there was a thriving trade of children, and they were sending them to places like Baalbek. For what? Or to the temple of Remphan in the land of Canaan, which would never be on a map now because it could be anywhere from Syria to Iraq. We don't know. Built in honor of Malak. Or Baal. Both of them. One's the dad and one's the, the, you know, whatever. And one, pro, you know, created the other. And we don't really know. It's all just, you know, whatever. Same thing. And there are symbols that are used that we are not supposed to use. And people put them on their flags. People put them on, the, they wear them as necklaces. There's trinkets. And they say, isn't this pretty? Look at this. This is... And I'm thinking, oh, it's a wonderful satanic symbol you have there. Way to go. Because you have no clue what you're wearing or what it is. It just looked pretty. And it gives you some kind of energy. Joseph Gross, the statue of Bohemian Grove is an owl. Um, there is a building here in Austin that they try to use the excuse that it was made by a, a guy who was an engineer from Rice, and their mascot is the owl. But if you know the history, they chose that mascot. It doesn't matter. The end result is the same. They chose that mascot because of its intelligence. And Rice, people who go there, are highly intelligent. But some of the weird stuff, why the owl, you know, uh, mm. So there's a building here that, that looks like an owl, downtown Austin. I guess it would be that way. There's a lot of things we're going to talk about, but we can't talk about them all here. So what we've done and what I'm going to announce right now before I get off is that we are now on Rumble. We are going to be on Rumble and we are, but, but they have made it to where you cannot just instantly download everything and put it on rumble you have to do each one individually so we have to put every single video one by one by one onto rumble and on that channel i will be able to tell you and go into deeper detail about all these things and not be so vague i have to respect the rules of youtube i don't own this platform i still am not the owner of it um so i have to, to abide by their 
terms of service. But everything we put here will be put on Rumble, but we will also go a little deeper and we will do a show on Rumble probably once a week or once every two weeks, and we're going to be doing investigations. And I'm serious about taking this to the next level and making this my livelihood. It's something that I enjoy. I do security and get and deal with contracts and all that because I have to, not because I want to. I lost my passion for it a long time ago. And now I have no interest in being a de facto cop, which is what they basically are wanting you to do because these people are out of control. Everything okay? Okay. Oh, thank you. You got me one of these. So sweet. And that's nice. This I like this water. It's really good. So if you enjoy the show and you like the show, help us keep it off of a paywall. Because we have to do something to reward the members, people who buy memberships for the show. <clears throat> So I've been watching the Blondes and Boos. I've been watching Tex and BMR and all my friends and Barton. And I'm still not down with the membership thing. But if you are willing to buy a membership, I'm willing to make a short for you once or twice a week for the members. And it's, it's just going to be a story here and there. But I hate that... Not everybody is able to watch and listen to any and all of my stories at any given time. But we have to generate income, folks. And I don't, and it's just like Thomas Winterton from the Skinwalker Ranch. He said it. You know, he's not going to feel bad about having to, to, to make money. Because without money, the show doesn't go. And I hate that. And I hate that it has to be that way. And I've never got up here and asked for money despite what people say. The lies that have been spewed about me, we're not going to get into it. They do it all the time. But we need camera equipment to do what we got to do. And we need to upgrade some of the stuff around here. And if you're willing to buy a membership, which I don't even know how much. I don't know if, Anthony, if you're listening, you come in here and maybe give me something because I don't know how much it is. We will do something for you. What, I don't know exactly, but we're going to figure it out. But I know the money's tight. And... Mark my words, we're heading for a recession. I believe a recession in likes of which we've never seen. Because another one of my subjects is economy. And I know the economy. And I know a lot of people don't like the guy who's going to be running for the Republicans. And it really, sh it, you know, I'm not going to get into it. You need to be thinking about the economy. Because in Canada, they're standing in line. Believe it. Uh, blues, blues to, to Miv, I don't know how you say your name. Do you know why the poem Howl mentions Moloch? Uh, uh, all, what? All, 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 ought? I don't understand. What are you saying? Yeah, Eve, I, yeah, that's, I mean, that's, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to vote with my mindset on the economy. I don't care what people say. If I was going to sit here and worry about bad words, I wouldn't have talked to the guys I talked to today and just buried the hatchet. I'd be like, yeah, you said bad words, mean words to me. I don't give a crap. Rearview mirror as far as I'm concerned. Person who can't put things behind them will always have them in front of them. Right? It's common sense. Joyce Burnett says it's five ninety nine. I don't know. I'd have to wait for Anthony. I don't know where Anthony's at. He'd have to tell me. Auntie Honey says a dollar a person times thirty two thousand subscribers. Come on, people, it's for Josh. Well, thank you. It's actually for me. There's about eight of us that are involved in the show, not just me. But we need certain things. We need cameras. We need things we gotta get done. We have things we have to do. And we have kept this with as little commercials as possible. We've kept our word, and we've never put anything behind a paywall. The only thing I need to do is reward the people who are 
members. And how do we do that? We give you extra content. It's not going to be a whole bunch of stuff, but I will make something to where it will be for the members. I got to give you something because you're willing to put out the money for it. And I appreciate everybody who's a Patreon member. And if you're a Patreon member and you're owed a swag bag and you haven't gotten one, well, let me know. There are several people that have reached, reached out to me in the last week. We are going to try and mail off this coming week. The mail off has been really hard because we lost our list. But we will get it done. And you know we do. We always get it done. We did cross over today. 32,000 subscribers. We are now at 32,000. It's, um, it's not a goal for me. The goal is to get to 35. But it's moving towards our goal. Once we get to 35, the goal is 40, and it just keeps going like that. So I'm not going to pop champagne and think, oh, we're well on our way to being something great, because we will eventually, but we're not there yet. And I enjoy doing this, and I enjoy talking to you, and I enjoy the history, and I enjoy everything we're doing with PRT and the music. Nelly, she's an unbelievably talented songwriter. Never knew she had that in her. I knew she could write poetry. But if you can write poetry, you can write music. That's something that Ken talked about in the dinner the other day. Thank you, Rita Burnett. Also, you and Kate Hunter, favorite people. Larry Fisher, all you people that come through for me, helping out to get things done. There's Anthony. So the conclusion to our story... My friend, whose name I said I wouldn't mention, I'll call him M. He said, once he lost that necklace, it wasn't like instantaneous he went into poverty, he goes, but my finances have never been the same. A lot of problems. I gave him some advice. I said, draw an eight on a, on a piece of paper, both sides, go get it laminated, put it in your wallet. I don't know if it's working for him or not. I haven't checked in with him since then. But I have one in my wallet, and we all pulled one out when we were talking on the, uh, what was it, Saturday before last or something? Yeah. So, and if you're wanting to look into some of these things, set. If you look into that, that is isn't that is a cult that's still practiced here in the United States. And I'll explain to you before I go who that is. But Sekhmet is often worshipped simultaneously because of the power of the, of the war aspect of it, kind of like Mars. Here's the interesting thing about this. And there's different, like I said, all religions, they're not all the same. Even if it's the same Methodist, there's different types of Methodists, right? Different types of Baptists. The, the figure of Set, if anybody knows the story, he was Osiris' brother. He was the bad guy. Horus was the son of Osiris. And, of course, Set did not like him. He wanted to destroy him. He wanted to get rid of him. <laughs> 
He was basically what the Norse called Loki. He was like a, a trickster. Yes, Paul. Set is basically the Egyptian devil. But there's always those that are going to worship the flip side and do what is the bad or whatever. Us as Christians, in particular the Coptics in Egypt, they already know the history. They know that the Egyptian gods and the Egyptian devils were all just different levels of devil. And that's what I believe. No, Wiccanize 8 is not just a number. But it's interesting that your name is Wiccanize and you believe that. I have, do you think seven was just a number two? What do you know about the number eight without looking it up? What do you know about the number seven? So, Seth, or Seth, did something that kind of ran simultaneously with, like, it, 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 they, they overlapped. Sekhmet, the goddess was also worshipped in the same cult, but for different reasons. Segment was in charge of creating havoc, too, like natural disasters and wars. Set did the same thing. So they were kind of on the same level. Segment was a goddess akin to Hecate from the Greek tradition. When you look at these two characters as essential characters in the history of Egypt, no matter what Abrahamic faith rolled through there, no matter what other religion like the, like Amun-Ra, doesn't matter, the sun worship, whatever that took place later, not to be confused with what's going on, you know, with, with these cults, there were people who were still hanging on to these old ways, and they, they tried to stamp it out multiple times because of the children being grabbed and whatever. Sekhmet was very evil to me, in, in my opinion, even though supposedly she was the life bringer, she was also the life taker because it was the yin and the yang. War was her tool. Think of a little bit of Loki mixed with Ares. Ares being the god of war of Greek tradition. Two Shadows, thank you for that donation. And who else do we got? G G G what is this? G Van Zant. Again, 661. Sorry. $10. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. And Two Shadows, thank you for that donation. Or tip, as they call it in Rumble. Anyways, so you had these two beings who basically were evil and terrorized everybody, and they were worshipped. And they still are. Bad guys. The bad guys, right? But there's always those who will turn to the dark side to get what they want. Eve Ayers, she was a healer and brought plagues. Yeah. Very dualistic, not necessarily bad. Well, here's what I'll say. And this is why I'm going to close with this. It is said that Zeus the, the, was the, the, the head god of the Greeks, but only at one time. Now, if you notice all these places, there is no one god that was always the god who was always in charge. Before him, there was Kronos, right, who ate all of his siblings, and then Zeus was the youngest, and he freed all of his siblings, and then he became the badass, whatever. It was said that he despised Ares. They didn't like Ares. The other gods were leery of him. They didn't like him. They tended to be aloof around him. Same thing for the Roman version of Ares, which was Mars. Saturn was the bad guy, right? Jupiter, the good guy. But neither one of them really liked uh, uh, Mars. Because Mars, it was said, was drunk on the blood 
of human misfortune brought on by war. Aries, same thing. Both very much dualistic. You needed the war to protect yourself. And if you were going to fight, well, you had to have his blessing. But you had to spill blood. And the more you spilled, the more he protected you. Which is very what? Demonic. So there you go. The red planet Mars is named after Mars, the god of war, because it's red for blood. So you have the goddess of war segment. What happens in war? One side dies and gets killed and gets destroyed. The other ones lose some, but they manage to win. And what was theirs becomes mine. What was yours becomes mine. And they become rich. There again, going back to the root of all evil, as Christ said, money. Because you take what the other side's had, and you take it. It becomes yours. You defeated them. So then it's yours. That right there is the crux of it all. So it doesn't matter what amulet you wear, but when you're dipping it into an Egyptian tomb, into the sand that holds a residual energy, and some of that sand is crystals, and it holds an energy. I don't give a crap what anybody says or what religion they are. It is the truth. And it doesn't mean that it's good or bad. It's just energy. Then you use that energy. Because everybody does it one way or the other. You find a higher power and you cling to it. Mine is Christ. That is my higher power and I cling to him with everything I got. Because the night is full of terrors. There are creatures running around out there that look like Anubis. And we can't explain it. Go look at the episode of the Egyptian magic. There are creatures running around out there that look like wolves on two legs. There's a creature running out there that looks like a giant ape that rips trees out of the ground, throws them at people and breaks limbs and builds habitation. We don't know what it is. There's things that come up out of the earth. There are elementals, basic elementals like fire, wind, water, earth. We don't know what they are. There are beings that are sub-nature as they call them, gnomes, dwarves, elves, trolls, orcs. We've even had people talk about that. Right? Oh, yeah. Pretty much anything you can think of. Wiccanize. I know where you're coming from. It says the root of evil is money, but the collection no, of plate is the, passed by. The right? money is not the root of all evil. The, lo the love of money is the root of all evil. That, that's what the scripture says. It means mm -hmm. talking about greed, not... Money is just money. Well, that still doesn't address what they're saying. What they're saying is, and it is the root of all evil, it is, the, the love and greed of it and the worship of mammon, right? <clears throat> because when you obsess on anything, which I fully believe my dad is this way. Yeah. He obsesses over money. And I've accused him of it before. I said, you're, you're basically, you're a worshiper of mammon. I don't want to hear all of what you tell me. Like, well, of course you don't, because that's what you do. He has put money before everything in his life. and every relationship he's ever had, money has come first. The purse comes first. And I'll tell you what, except for maybe his wife. She's the only one I've ever seen that he gave any real love to. As hard as he tried, he couldn't do it. Recognize, yes. Hell, I've never seen you in my chat before. I'll take it that you're not a bad person. I take it that you practice Wiccan by the name. Money can be used for evil, yes. Elementals are everywhere. Only some can see them. Yeah, it's pretty basic. The root of evil is money, but the connection <clears throat> place passes about in church. I don't think every church is good. No. And I don't think all the churches that are collecting money should be collecting money. The church, I think, is like one of, call it what you will, the the devil, Shaitan. It's, it's, I think it's their favorite business model. 
Because I mean, like it, to it, pretend, yeah, yeah. I mean, like mm-hmm. what what greater victory than than to take the, uh, God's children and just like lead them astray and pump their head full of lies mm-hmm. and have them not even realize that they're basically glorifying you more than they are the God they claim to worship. It's like a perverted like satisfaction or something. It's like uh, John Hagee or Joel Osteen or Benny Hinn, uh, Kenneth Copeland. Um, Creflo Dollar, Tyler Perry. I mean, look at all the people who basically worship them even more than they they claim than, than they worship God. You know, they, they love those men even more than than they love Christ because those men tell them what they want to hear. They they preach this thing called the prosperity gospel, which is basically like if if you just pray enough, then God will give you money and God will give you all the material riches, all the things that you want. And people believe that. John Higgy went went on TV and said Jesus Christ did not come to be the Messiah. Yeah, he said. And people not. still follow this guy. They still. Yeah. No matter how many times you blaspheme, it's like. And matter. Kenneth Copeland straight up looks like a fully, a perfectly possessed human being. He does. And people listen to what this man has to say. He's like you know? ninety years old. Here, here's the catch. There's always this duality. People will say, oh, well, I'm a, this is what they'll say. They'll say they're a Luciferian because they have a sympathy for him. There was a guy on my show years ago, early on. He was from, uh, his name was Simon. I'm not going to say his last name. He was on my show. Well, actually, it doesn't really matter. His name's Simon Young. I mean, because he was on my show, and the, that's there as a matter of record. Go and listen to the interviews with him. He sympathizes on my show with that. And that was one of the people who was a part of that Dogman X group that I had to get the hell away from. They were always attacking women, attacking Christians, and attack pretty much anybody who didn't believe the dog man was a flesh and blood being, which was the first, when I first started to look into what this thing might be, and I was like, you know, these people, they will fight vehemently for their belief, which is, I believe is wrong anyway, but then they'll, they're willing to destroy anybody who they don't agree with. But there's always this duality, and you'll say, why would they worship something like sex men? Well, I'll tell you. They'll follow something like that because even though she terrorized Egypt and did all these bad things, Ra, the sun god at that time, whatever, went and, and defeated her or outsmarted her or whatever. He, he you know, took, got, got the better of her. Then she embraced love. Somehow she saw love and light and thought, I'm wrong. I shouldn't be doing this. Somehow she found enlightenment and she became Hathor, the goddess of love. Just like that. And it was used as a testament to the power of Ra, how powerful he was. He he convinced the evil witch, you know, lady to turn over a new leaf and become good. But if you look at the Hindu culture, Brahman is multiple gods all rolled into one. Every single god, whether it's Shiva or Kali, it doesn't matter. They're all him. They're all just aspects of him. Divided up into a million different gods. Even the prosperity god, Ganesh, they're all just him. right? Ganesh is the elephant if you go into a, a hotel, motel run by people from India, typically they're Gujaratis. Ask them, say, are you Gujarati? They'll probably tell you, yeah. Sometimes Punjabi, typically Gujaratis, but they'll have the little statue of Ganesh with the, the incense. It's for prosperity. But in the end, it is just Brahman. Because they are actually a monotheistic religion that is sliced up to look like a polytheistic religion. It's very confusing to the untrained eye. When you look at this, these people that worship Sekhmet, they'll say, oh, no, no, she's a good guy. But is that the aspect that you are worshiping? Is that the aspect that you're looking at? Probably not. They're probably looking at the aspect of Mars, Aries, Sekhmet, all being kind of the same being and you give them blood, 
and they give you what you want, which is purely 100% evil satanic. You can call it what you want. You can cut it however you want. That's it. That's what it is. So, my friend M figured it out, was visited at night one time by a being that looked otherworldly, a female that he thought he was dealing with was a succubus. I believe it was an avatar of Sekhmet, and I believe it came from his grandmother and the various items that he had inherited from her when she passed. And I gave him some advice. I said, take that stuff and throw it in the garbage. Everything you got from her. He did get some gold that was fashioned into different types of jewelry. And I said, melt it down and sell the gold. Which turned out to be 24 karat, which is pure. Mm -hmm. It's 999, 999, whatever. Blah, 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 blah. So there's that. Like I said. I give him the advice. He can do what he wants. As for me and my house, we will worship the Lord God, the Father of Christ, and always have and always will. There will be no whatever. False gods. You, on the other hand, are welcome to do what you want. You're welcome to believe how you want. And you're welcome to listen to the show however often or however little you want to. If you want to learn, come learn. If you want to hear the, the retelling of encounters, of why you should learn, well, learn. John Sablon, I tend to agree. Yes, anytime you bring in desire, it requires a sacrifice, which is why desire leads to black magic or praying for money. Unfortunately, the world we live in, money, you got to have it. Because without it, I can't get the cameras I need. But I'm still not going to go and spill blood to get it. <laughs> and if you think about it, people who deal with the underworld <clears throat> in any shape or form, when they spill blood, even they'll even say, oh, well, it's nothing personal. It's just business. You're still spilling blood for money. That's why it's called blood money. Gangsters like Al Capone and Lucky Luciano... Bugsy Siegel, they didn't look at themselves as satanic, black magic worshippers. They were still doing it. Yeah, I think some of the best servants of, of darkness are the ones who don't even realize they're serving it. Yeah, they don't even acknowledge who, who, it. Uh, yeah, who, who probably don't even believe it's real. Probably think it's just a bunch of crap. Like, they are the best servants of malevolent spiritual forces ever. They're just, they're so useful to them. Yeah, Absolutely. So that being said, we're going to run. Thank you for everybody who donated to help us or tipped me, as they would say in Rumble. We are going to get Rumble done. We got started, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But unfortunately, I saw the email. We're going to have to download each one of them individually. Yeah, yeah, because they used to have a tool that would sync all of our videos to the, like, automatically. And it, it would take a while, but, like, we, we, we wouldn't have to manually do it. But now that tool doesn't work. So uh, I got to go back and upload each and every single one of our YouTube videos individually. It's, it's going to be a while before the uh, the Rumble channel is up to date with the YouTube channel. So just bear with us, but it, it, it'll get there. So that being said, thank you for listening. Thank you for tuning in. We thank you for all of your support. We actually went through a rough patch this weekend, and we thought about just packing it in. What is this? See you in six months. I don't know. Why six months? I got That's weird. What's in six months? <clears throat> Anyways, folks, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for listening. We will have... Uh, my conference, yes, the conference will, will is a go. It's going to be hopefully the first week of, of November. We're, we're planning on that. Oh, you only get time off, huh? 
Yeah, Eve, you're right. It's going to take a while. We're going to get it done. What is it with the, the, the muscles here, dude? This guy that wants me to hit hit a double bicep pose. What, what is this? Like, when I do this or something? Like, I don't know. What do you want to see? Some? Do you want to see some skin? Is that what you want? Ooh. Ooh. You know. He wants you to do the Chris Farley Chip and Dale dance. <laughs> the way he would do that. Yeah. Lay off me. I'm starving. Lay off, back off. I'm starving. All right, folks, I got to get recording here for Tuesday. I don't know. Before we go, somebody wants to give me what they want here. We have the, the horrors of the desert of Petra. The Jordanian story, it involves a werewolf, too. Or Costa Rican hotel werewolf. What do you want to hear? Petra. Jordan. Petra. Good. We'll do Petra. That's what we'll do. See, that's why you tune in. You get to make those decisions. Thank you for tuning in. We'll see you. Good night. Oh, wait. Don't forget to check out Paranormal Sound Table. There's 400 people in this chat right now. Please, run over there to Paranormal Sound Table. Take you two seconds, and you can subscribe. We're coming out with new music every week. We're coming out with two new ones this week. I believe one is the is Mermaid or Merfolk, whatever. And then the other one is the Flying Dutchman. Ocean going theme this week. Pretty good stuff. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. The Bear King, I think, what is it, like 5,000 views now or something? Yeah. Bear King, boy. Hmm. I can pat myself on the back for that one. I had a little bit of help in that one there. It's 11 11. When you see 11 11, what do you think that means? Everybody's got their own opinion about it. I'll see you. Good night.